Okay, so we will we will jump back in. Uh, we will. So we will. I'll try to set aside a little more time at the end of the this session for some uh, for some discussion, uh, which is really my the point of the introduction of the material in the first place is to is to develop that conversation. Um, so we we move then to the uh, second. Our, our sort of sec second chapter of the book and second plateau, if you like, um, of uh, for the for the brief, um, revisiting this for a moment of which is the artificial plan, which which will obviously which suggests the discussion of the artificiality and the plan. And so forth. we revisit revisit this um, statement, uh, sort of opening statement of the def this definition of the terraforming to come, not the terraforming the historical terraforming through which we've arrived at this point, or the terraforming that would nevertheless happen regardless, but the ter territory as a deliberate project um, is this as this. Comprehensive transformation of cities, technologies, ecosystems to ensure that that this would that this will continue to support Earth-like life, not terraforming of other planets, but indeed terraforming of this one. Uh, artificiality, astronomy, and automation form the basis of this. The, we've we've touched a little bit on the astronomy and automation. We'll definitely go a little further into the automation. Um, what I want to spend some time with at this moment is this is this notion of artificiality. And the in the connotation of something that is deliberately composed and uh, uh, designed, and part of and to try to ask in a direct and perhaps sometimes impertinent way, um, uh, why is it that this that the inevitability of this artificiality uh, is is such a difficult place to move into and out of? So. Let's start with this question of setting up this relationship. Another, start from a slightly different place. The setting up this relationship between um, the, the the project for this ecological composition um, and the automation one in relationship to this um, to this date of twenty thirty. And so um, we we find this. Operating in at least a couple in, in, in at least a couple ways, and, and and it was in the writing of this book this this past July um, that this this date made itself manifest repeatedly um, as this is a pattern. It was sort of impossible to ignore. You're, you're probably familiar with this, the invocation of the date 2030 around some of the Green New Deal discourses, and roughly what it sort of you know it, it is meant to indicate. Is that um, based on uh, the li likely carbon budgets um, that we're sort of that operating with? That unless fundamental transforma transformation is undertaken successfully um, to decarbonize uh, infrastructures more broadly, that um, the runaway effects after the year 2030 will be such that it doesn't really matter necessarily a whole lot what happens after this particular date. Um, and so it's not that the world is going to end in 2030, but rather that 2030 represents a kind of uh, something of a deadline um, in order to prevent this this process from happening. Um, meanwhile, uh, we also saw in, really, over this previous summer the invocation of the same date of 2030 repeatedly again and again um, by economists to represent a, a different kind of emergency um, the, that that posed by AI and automation more generally um, the, in terms of um, late job loss, the famous Fry and Osborne study that hypothesized 50 some percent of jobs potentially lost to hardware software based automation in the UK. Um, Andrew Yang's uh, presidential campaign focusing on issues primarily of issues of loss of blue collar labor and the political instability um, around automation in this case. Um, but in general, this term, this date of 2030 is invoked here once again as unless we make, unless we fundamentally address the complexities and potential risks of this transformation of an economic um, infrastructure by this date, that the runaway effects that are likely to happen will be ones that are 
potentially outside of our control. It's not that one, the world, again, not that the one will end at this point in time, but this represents a kind of threshold point um, by which uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, our capacity to intervene in them in a way that's effectively um, has, a, has a kind of limit. And so part of what we then, uh, the question that we then ask in relationship to this is, is whether or not, and to put it directly, whether or not they really are, how is it that these are two different questions, two different emergencies, two different challenges and crises, and to what, or to what extent are they actually interrelated, uh, either in the origins of the crisis point or in the paths towards uh, engagement with these crises, essentially by this year, um, essentially by this year, 2030. And again, it's obviously something of an arbitrary, an arbitrary signifier that we're using just as a way to try to smash these two things together um, into a kind of a kind of single a kind of single question. The hypothesis is that they in fact are deeply interrelated, and that there may in fact not be any way to effectively address the the fundamental fast and deep decarbonization of uh, our planetary infrastructure that does not make extensive use of automation as towards the purpose and goal of that decarbonization. That to do so without, with, uh, w without this technique may in fact be uh, Im implausible. And at the same time to, uh, to, to ask to what purpose does in fact the automation of these infrastructural systems serve other than to uh, introduce these uh, uh, chemical and energistic uh, efficiencies um, into this as well. That the, the question of trying to address climate change without the, um, the, the in, in a way that does not put it inside the question of automation may in fact be impossible to address this question of automation in a way that is not inside the question of, of, um, of, a, of a climate change may also be um, equally, um, equally Im Im impossible. Uh, and so this, this nesting of one inside of the other um, becomes the sort of the basis by which we try to think about the addressing of, of the two. Now, um, the response, the, the implication then of this uh, position of response is one that would hold that the response to anthropogenic climate change must be equally anthropogenic that the response to anthropogenic climate change must in fact be as anthropogenic as the, uh, as the conditions in which we have, in the conditions which we have arrived here. In other words, that it must be adamantly and unapologetically um, artifi ar artificial. Um, anthropogenic simply meaning of a, of a certain of a, a kind of uh, human, human origin. And as such, this means, uh, with, with for certain, a, uh, a redefinition, reconnotation, repositioning, what we would even mean by uh, the natural, if that is understood, when and if that is understood as something that is, it, it, that it has some kind of, um, of, of, of inverted adjacency with, um, with the artificial. The nature-culture divide, in what way or another, is put into question. Um, by this. Not only is put into question by this the idea that the proper response to anthropogenic climate change is, is one in which that would be ultimately non-anthropogenic, that, that would have, that would, that from which our agency would be utterly withdrawn. Um, it would also uh, challenge the, the, a, 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 a kind of uh, presumed presence that and in essence, an excess of that which is conventionally understood to be on the culture side of this, uh, an excess on this culture side of this divide, is what is is what has caused, or in fact, is indeed the 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 anthropogenic, the anthropocenic uh, 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 condition, and so the, a, a kind of rebalancing of this divide, in which there is more nature now to make up for the too much culture, if you like, um, is also uh, directly put into question around this as well. At, at the very least also because the, 
and we'll, we'll talk a bit about the different sort of versions of this, but because in the sort of the Anglo connotations of the nature culture divide, uh, in which the nature is elevated to a kind of uh, the sort of transcend transcendent or superior position within this binary, the thing which has a kind of greater value, did very little to actually protect the things that were identified as nature. The fact that it was idealized didn't really help or work uh, in order to sort of work. In fact, I would argue it did the opposite. Um, that it actually provided, that the, that the invocation of the natural actually provided and continues to provide a flexible alibi, um, uh, not, o that not only for the, that there is, in fact, an away, an exterior, an exterior place to which waste can be thrown, for like that there is, in fact, an over there that is, that, to which is sort of to work. Um, but because, and this goes back exactly to what we were speaking at the end of the last session about the, the kind of fundamental upstreamness of the chemical, if you like, or the sort of substrate, the sort of materialism here as well, um, is that is in the way in which it therefore defines culture as something that is, uh, in, in a way, un, unnatural. Um, that it is, that it is uh, a, a kind of uh, that it is elevated from its geologic and biologic strata. Uh, that it is ideal. That it is immaterial. That it is virtual. That it is mind as opposed to brain, that this repetition of the, that, that sort of uh, version of distinction, um, that it is therefore only bound by a kind of self-accountable um, realm of, of its expressivity. We would criticize or understand the monoculture not in terms of its geologic or biological purposes, but rather in terms of its as a kind of massless semiotics. Um, and this is part of the problem. Right? This is part of the alibi. This is part of the alibi. Now, while the very idea of an absolute outside of culture uh, is more or less discredited, I think at a certain point you're not going to, the art, it's not so hard to convince someone that actually, you know, the nature culture divide is kind of a convention and that, you know, really it's just the table, it's the table of elements, it's hydrogen, helium, carbon, like there really isn't a nature nature, it's all kind of, Whatever and people will say, yeah, yeah, okay, I get, sort of, I get this. Um, but the inverse, as we've said, is, is much harder to swallow, um, or at least for sort of to many. That is, if in this um, disassembly of this particular natural culture uh, divide, um, and in this disassembly, the there is a kind of disappearance of the of of the nature or it, 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 as as a sort of structure but the, it it also implies this inverse like because there is no nature at least in the accordance of this divide it also means that there is no culture which is harder for i think in a sense for is the harder argument to sort to, to for it to be sort of absorbed um, there is chemistry and abstraction and phase change and material folding and cognition and modeling and sensing and embodiment and, and, and technicity and pattern finding, collapse, all of these things obviously continue. Um, and they are what they are. One thing that they are not, however, is this kind of uh, massless, virtual, ideal operation of, of self-accountable expressivity. They are, in fact, part of the metabolism. Exactly to the point of that narratives are chemical means they have weight and cost and can be expensive and require extraction, require other forms of, uh, and not just extraction, require other forms of geological kinds of operations in this, in, in this say as well. It also then implies that the, as I sort of indicated, that the, that the accelerated pursuit of cultural expression, what we would recognize as cultural expression, for its own sake, as a, as a un, uncontestable ideal and um, obvious, uh, uh, obviously something to be supported and congratulated, um, is also then sort of put, in, sort of put into some degree of suspicion. 
Um, now, there's a number of ways in which we, we could uh, reorient re ourselves towards the um, arbitrariness and thereby plasticity of the, these kinds of divide. And again, I think to the point that someone was raising earlier, asking around the, the significance of the arbitrariness here as well, and also to your question about the, the arbitrary. The arbitrary just it means it, it, one, one of the implications of it, it shouldn't be that <clears throat> it can be remade in some way. Because these distinctions are arbitrary and have been arbitrary, they can be re-arbitrated. So um, this is some diagram from Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, uh, published in 1964, at least in, in, in French, I think, of the book translated into English as The Raw and the Cooked. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, it is, is a, a, a super summary sort of reading it here as well, but it's useful for us, in, on, I think, on this sort of matter. That, so Levi-Strauss is, is in this sort of key, um, key work of, of structural, structural anthropology. Um, obvi obvi the, the, my inclusion of this here is a bit, is uh, hopefully taken as a bit ironic in the sense in which this moment in structural anthropology was provided for the foundations of the semiotic turn um, within European thought that to, certain, to a certain degree um, is most responsible, arguably, for this, the actually the dematerialization um, of, the, of, of the sign um, that we are arguing against. However, it, the, in, a nut, in, in, a, in a sense, what, what Levi Strauss is looking at are, is, is a kind of comparative cultural analysis of um, uh, the Bororo and a few other, and a number of other groups that he lived with in, in, in what we call South America uh, and, and other places, uh, in terms of the ways in which they differentiate f the f forms of matter into different kinds of forms of matter, that that object is part of the nature and that part of, is part of the culture, if you, if you like, but a special kind of matter. The kind of matter that, when introduced, to some deliberate action of its chemical transformation, usually heat. This matter is transformed into a spe the special kind of matter that we ingest that becomes us. The world, the part of the world that we ingest that becomes us, that is food. This unique form of matter. And the differentiation of, these, of the objects in the world, not only into the edible and the inedible, which obviously is, can be quite different based on different cultural conventions, and pretty much everything is edible if you try hard enough. Um, but the differentiation of that process on the difference, the, this process of the transformation between the, as you see here, the raw and the cooked. The raw being those things in their kind of state of, if you like, a kind of state of nature, and the cooked being the same matter, but once it has been enculturated, uh, and the act of the cooking itself and the culinary Conventions and the culinary chem and, the, and the, the the chemical ex the, the expertise and the chemical transformations of this object into a kind of structure here's structural here's, here's as well and so what should say is that there's some uh, an argument to be made that there may be some if not an anthropological universal at least so, like a certain a, a kind of um, a, a pattern. A, a, a pattern and tendency um, for us to differentiate objects and indeed the world around us according to some sort of logic of a kind of primordialization of an interiorization of exterior, like what's, what is inside of the us and what is the outside of the that? What is the exterior in which whatever we are as a thing is the, is we are the foreground, it is the background, some kind of condition of that and the maintenance and policing of those boundaries. Some, and sometimes quite ex explicit, sometimes implicit, sometimes quite peculiar uh, kinds of ways of policing, if you like, or at least maintaining, or or recognizing, or internalizing as a matter of convention some of those some of those kinds of boundaries. Skipping forward a little bit um, to another um, another group of natives. In this case, um, those in 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 a, in a place called Britain. Um, uh, Raymond Williams, um, there's a, a, one of the, of the sort of his wonderful sort of book of uh, uh, keywords, is sort of his Raymond Williams sort of glossary. This entry on, on, on uh, 
nature in William Williams Keyworth is, is which will sort of send you a really sort of wonderful little history, you know, extremely short sort of uh, econ economy of text of the history of the concept of nature in uh, uh, pre-modern and modern England. And what comes through, what, what is, well, I won't, we can, there's a, much to sort of discuss there, but in the, one of the key, um, the key references or key sort of conclusions that, that Williams draws from this is how closely related the concept and the boundaries between nature culture in, again, in pre-modern and modern England um, were to particular organizations of the land itself. That the territorialization of the concept and the concept as the basis of a territorialization of the space were deeply imbricated. That nature wasn't only a type of object or something that you do, something that is or like a type of object before you cook. It was actually, it was a place. Nature was, it was a place. It was a place on the other side of the, of the physical boundary, not just the, the, the uh, conventional or uh, conventional or semiotic, uh, semiotic boundary. But it was still very much a, a, always this kind of a, an, uh, an exterior. It's not something that's happening here. It is not something that the, the process by which, um, the process by which you know to put ourselves in this sort of to ventriloquize this the notion, the process by which we come to produce concepts um, about the world, is to echo your point in, in a way a qualitatively, even ontologically um, separate procedure than the world about which those processes are being about processes are being constructed, and then this becomes this basis of a, also a kind of territorialization around this as well. Um, so another way in which we might think about the introduction of the artificial into this and, and, and a, a, um, an attempt to uh, elevate or transform this an understanding and relationship to the notion of artificial that isn't dependent upon these same kind of nature culture distinctions, which as we've argued I think is, is, is a necessary thing. Um, the artificial might be said is it's, it's what is left af left over after that representational aspiration of the natural collapses. Um, it is part of a kind of antisocial turn. I would argue it's perhaps a kind of a different kind of ontological turn. Obviously, anthropology is in, is in recent years went through its own what it called an, anthrop an ontological turn that is quite different than what we're. Suggest, suggesting here, in, the, in that it was, and that it was, uh, it, it attempted to identify a kind of um, a certain kind of egalitarian equivalency between ontological models um, that might be closer to this the representationalism that we discussed earlier. Um, yeah, it is some, the artificial. Then is sort of something that is formed <coughs> by that technical apparatus. Um, but which is, has previously been sort of excluded in this sort of place as well. Um, I would want to then, just to sort of um, underscore this point to uh, ensure that we're sort of clear on where I'm trying to sort of make, this, make the differentiation here, is that in, in, a, in a way we're still in this sort of process of discovering this grasping or um, reclaiming, if you like, of the artificial uh, as an ontological premise should be one that is the result of the these kind of um, disanthropocentric uh, maneuvers that we're, we're working with. But again, it's one that doesn't just function to displace the human sense of their own centrality from the position, but one in which it makes clearer to a greater extent, the specificity of the human as this particular uh, creature, entity, assemblage that possesses its own sort of, sort of agency that it might sort of enter into as well, and one that is one that is hopefully, in doing so, much more suspicious of its our own tendency to uh, introduce and project narratives and to um, 
to presume and inform the world with our narratives in such a way that it becomes sometimes very difficult to differentiate that, project, that projection from the thing itself. We understand that this is something that we do. We understand that this is, in fact, a, a rather expensive and amazing accomplishment of our evolutionary arc. Um, but it's one that we should, because we, that we should hold in a certain degree of, of, of a certain degree of, of suspicion. Now, to differentiate this a little bit from some of the, the ontological, some of the tendencies of ontological turn in anthropology, some variations, some interpretations of the of triple O and, and its relation to uh, new materialism. I think the idea here is not simply a kind of of, of a, 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 a conclusion that um, that there is a kind of egalitarian equivalence between all all ontological claims, uh, but rather that the uh, th that the ontology that we must approach is one that requires and demands this continuing process of disorientation and dis disenchantment, as opposed to, for example, what we might call um, in, in, a very in, a, in a very anthropologically unscientific way, a animism, which I mean not, to re not just to refer to specific practices of specific peoples and cultures that are identified as animistic, but rather as a general tendency, including the most technologically advanced societies, uh, so-called, to personify and to project and to incorporate the world into a narrativization uh, in order to make sense of this, to anthropomorphize not just ourselves, but things in the world in order to make sense of them, and to amplify, condense, and enforce that, those narrative projections um, as if they were uh, basic to these, these uh, interior, exterior, natural, cultural boundaries. So for example, um, there's a certain way in which the the premise of a kind of animistic thought, which might be, you know, we sort of think it is one in which um, the things of the world all have uh, their own, they're, they're in possession of their own feature, function, agency, persona, personality, wishes, um, and, and so forth. Now, one reading of this within the ontological turn and some forms of the critiques of the Anthropocentrism within anthropology more broadly is that this is in fact um, that this is a way of thinking the world and and a, and a kind of an ontological framework uh, that is the logical conclusion of that of the Copernican trauma, the logical conclusion of the of the disanthropocentrizing turn, because it's one in which we are just one more creature in the show, that our role within this large drama. Is, 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 is what it is, but it's in, in relationship to the mountain, the animals, the rivers, the streams, the iPhones, which all have their own, they all have their own um, uh, drama and, and structure to play, and to play out. Uh, and that this introduces a kind of uh, modesty uh, in relationship to the complexity of this larger narrativization of, 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 of the world. Um, the way I see this is really quite differently. I see that this, the animistic impulse in this regard as not the modest withdrawal of the premise that the world works according to our plan, the world works according to our needs and our logics, but rather the, the extraordinary expansion of this premise, extraordinary amplification of this premise into a generalized anthropomorphization of everything, such that everything from the, every creature, every tree, every rock, every animal, way or another, is, is, or is something that we are able to and willing to engage with and think through to the extent that, that uh, we do so through um, its fictionalization within a within this within this representational logic. In short, the red-eyed tree frog 
doesn't know or doesn't and doesn't care whether or not it is your spirit animal. And neither does your phone, for that matter. My, the point I'm trying to make is not one in which to, to indicate that there is these, that there's some kind of, to recapitulate some kind of separation between the, the superstitious people and the enlightened ones. Quite to the contrary, I would argue that in many respects, this kind of animistic projection by which the, the anthropomorphization and personification of things in the world is something that um, the so-called Western world is extremely good at in ways or another. And it, a lot of it is, is this, again, this reinforcement and amplification of the premise that the, the experience of the world, the experience of the experience of the world is in of itself a transcendental ideal for which everything must fall away. Now, the implications of this, again, I want then to go into a little bit what we mean then by the artificial. Um, I think the implications of this for urban planetarity are perhaps a bit counterintuitive. Now, instead of reviving ideas, or they, but they shouldn't be. I, I think instead of reviving ideas of nature, we would want to then reclaim the artificial, again, not as in fate, but as in, as in design. Um, it's also absolutely true that no two, no two cultures would ever define the artificial the same way. What is in fact made and not made? Also, like what is in fact just as what is in fact you know natural, cultural, whatever. But what is in fact made? What does made mean in a sense in a way? Like at what point? How made does something need to be for it to be made? If you get if you if you sort of see what this is a this is a absolutely contingent question. It's also for certain then that no two cultures would define intelligence in the same way, and, and thereby there's no way they would ever define artificial intelligence in the same way. But that's a whole other problem we'll have to deal with later. No, we want to then, in, in a sort of a rough heuristic definition of artificiality, we would define it as anomalous regularity. Anomalous regularity. Anomalous as in unusual, unexpected, too much, too little, out of the norm. Regularity within a system. You all can look at the picture of this actually real, not Photoshop, forest in Japan and point to the trees that were planted uh, in, a, in, a radial, in, in this radial pattern versus the ones that, were, that grew more or less um, higgledy-piggledy, to use the scientific term <laughs> for this as well. It's not that because you, you can clearly see the anomalous regularity in the structure of the sort of the trees here as well. It is order that exceeds what we would normally or expect it to be possible without some kind of deliberate intervention. This is, in a sense, a kind of gesture this as well. So again, it's not as in fake as our, as our style GAN people here as well. You know what I'm talking about. These are like, you know, this, this person is not real, dot com, so this as well. No, we need it more like this. The anomalous regularity within a system by which it's like that cannot possibly have happened just by itself. There had to have been some kind of act of deliberate composition um, within this within this, this, this as well. Um, the exception. Now, of all the artificial effects and patterns that really matter to us, and there may be a lot, uh, it's that impossible to sort boundary between what is and what is not anthropogenic within anthropogenic climate change that may be the one that sort of matters the most. You know, we, we understand that in a way, the, the terraforming, the historical terraforming, the one that has, the anthropocenic terraforming that has got us here is to a greater or lesser degree anthropogenic, but where that boundary is, what aspect of the artificial ecology that we now have is in fact artificial, is a matter of some confusion. There are ways in which this gets, gets developed in certain ways, but 
which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's a, a, what, a, a very interesting field of statistics. It's called attribution science. Attribution science is basically a field of statistics that is looking at and tries to identify, like to a degree of, of percentages, who or what and under what circumstances was responsible for a particular outcome. Insurance companies, obviously doing mo many of the more interesting advances in using model simulations of risk and future behavior are done by our heroes in the insurance industry um, to figure out who's responsible for the bridge collapse, who would be responsible for the, the carrier sinking. Exactly where was the, how can we statistically identify the conditions of agency in relationship to what would have been expected should some other action not have been taken. And so, and, and in many, and attribution science is a huge area within climate science as well. But what we're really looking at is something more like this. Um, I mean, maybe it's another way of sort of, of sort of grasping it. Um, you're all, when we're familiar with the, the sort of the Jody Foster contact kind of scenario of astronomers listening to signals from, from deep space, trying to find out whether or not the aliens are trying to communicate with us in one way or not. Yes, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There was this horrible movie um, uh, on, this, on this particular topic. Um, the, the Liu Shishun book, Dark Forest, is all predicated on this sort of as well. But in essence, and many of these projects sort of exist and continue one way or another. In, in, in essence, what they are doing is listening to as much gathering as much possible noise, background noise, that is the universe itself, and modeling and trying to deduce a signal from the noise that is anomalously regular, too regular that it could not possibly have just happened by itself. And in the identification of that signal that is anomalously regular, there is the hypothesis that something, something or someone must have made it so, must have composed it in this anomalous regularity of this thing, that there's a signature around this, sort of, around this as well. Um, later, we'll talk about the dark forest theory, which actually comes from not this novel, but from a, a, another, it's an idea, an idea that largely comes from another science fiction writer named David Brin, who argues why we should definitely not uh, make ourselves known within the universe. His argument is, it goes like this, that if you're in a dark forest and you're wondering, you don't know whether there's any predators around, you don't know if there's any bad animals sort of going on, the last thing you do is you walk through the dark forest going, hello, hello, <laughs> anybody there? And especially if that forest is very, very quiet, because the presumption is that all the other animals know something you don't know. And so the, the Drake equation that figures out how many possible intelligent intelligent civilizations must be in the universe, isn't that with the Fermi paradox? It's like, okay, given that there should be billions of intelligent civilizations, where the hell is everyone? One of the possible answers to the Fermi paradox is basically they're smart enough to be quiet. So stop broadcasting I Love Lucy into the, into the deep space. All right, now let's go down this rabbit hole a little bit more um, around this sort of as well. One of our other kind of patron saint figures, I suppose, for the program is a fellow named Nikolai Kardashev, uh, which we will talk about as well. We actually had tried to have Mr. Kardashev as a sort of guest of honor at the launch of the program here, at the sort of announcement of this film. He very rudely passed away a couple of weeks before the, this as well, but we'll let it slide. Um, 1964, it's a relatively obscure you, some of you may know this, but a relatively obscure um, Russian physicist. Um, public, 1963, uh, 1963, he examined the, the CTA 102 quasar, and he came up with this, and it sort of began the Soviet version of SETI. 1964, a year later, he publishes a paper, relatively obscure journal, that nevertheless becomes a huge kind of totally unlikely viral physics paper uh, in 1964, in which he posits a scale of civilizations which you see roughly sort of here. A, a Kardashev scale one civilization would be a civilization that is able to capture and make use of all of the energy of it, the, its, its host planet. Um, all of the energy of its host planet. You can use all the energy of the planet at once. Um, a, uh, and, and, and also of the, of the, um, that, uh, 
and, and, and the local star as well, I think is part of the type one. So it's all the local planet and all of the host stars, which would be sort of like our sun. Um, the type two would be able to make use of all of, or the, no, type one is the planet, type two is the star, type three is all of the energy of the host galaxy. Right? There's different variations in all this as well. So Carl Sagan estimated after this that we are, we are at about a 0 0.8, 0 0, or 0.08. We're, we're not, not very far along this kind of process as well. Now, if you wanted to find a type two civilization, which again is the one that, that is able to capture all of the, um, um, I think all of the, the energy of its, of its host sun, you would have to be able to identify something to where it, it, what would be the mechanism by which a, a civilization would be able to harness all of the energy of its host star? It would probably, it was hypothesized by a, another physicist at Princeton. Again, this was a very kind of popular paper. A guy named Freeman Dyson, who you might, who might have heard of from other contexts. Dy Freeman Dyson comes up with the ideas like, well, what they would probably do is they would wrap their star in some kind, imagine it like a giant inside out solar panel sphere or something, kind of a huge lattice of structure that goes all the way around the star that would absorb all the stars and the energy around which we, we should do this. Something that looks sort of like that, which later became to be called colloquially a Dyson sphere around this as well. Now, um, so this is the type twos. Um, it's interesting to know that, that what Dyson then, came, Dyson then hypothesizes in the early 70s, I think that we should be able to detect these. If you had a, if you had a civilization out there that had, that had its host star wrapped in a Dyson sphere, its signature would be um, you would have no visible light but still infrared light. Right? So the star is still there. It's still emitting all of this heat. You wouldn't be able to see it because it's wrapped in this thing, but it would, its heat signature would still be there. So why don't we scan the sky for spots in which there is a strong infrared signature but no visible light signature. That might be where some of these type two civilizations are. So the very first scan of the, of the, of the sky in infrared that we ever did uh, was looking for Dyson spheres in the early, early 70s. And what do you think they found? What? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, but but yes, and among and a million other and a bunch of other things too. They found tons of them. <laughs> there's lots of them. Other. There's uh, it, it, none of them. They've all found better explanations for most of these other than giant star encapsulating megastructures. But you never know. Um, in 2015, you might remember there was a, some other um, uh, sort of amateur astronomers. Um, working in the direction of an astrophysicist named Tabitha uh, Boyajen, um, who found a similar kind of uh, pattern from a, a distant star. And there was a bunch of sort of hype that maybe this was the alien megastructure we've been looking for all along. It turned out not to be, I'm sorry to say. Now, here's another sort of aspect on this in terms of the, 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 the determination of the artificiality here. Um, obviously, something like a type two civilization, we might say this is a highly artificial planetarity at work here uh, with some, we could say the sort of company. Um, a type three civilization though, one that is able to harness and use all of the energy of its own galaxy, will be much more difficult to detect. Um, that it's, that the entry points into them are ones in which that uh, are, 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 are framed primarily through these First person singular imaginaries and also first person singular solutions like, like plastic straws, of course, sitting on top of a pile of single use plastic water. So as we wait impatiently for these, these melodramas to play out, um, we see a few things. One, and I'll put it this way climate change denialism of all varieties is symptomatic of a folk humanism that will not allow for the idea that a dynamic Earth as planet um, to replace or displace or occupy the same place as a over-subjectivized, over-individuated, neoliberal, if you like, subjective sense of a fixed ground on which interior experience is, a given, is, is given form that that's what's caused it, and on which arbitrary cultural occupations are honorably fixed and perhaps even arranged by sovereign spirits. 
the illusory stability of the ground, back to your point about weightlessness and zero gravity, the illusory stability of the ground as something that not only is given for our signification, but is the basis of, from which signification might come as a first principle, even as the Earth's crust continues to bend and break and shift in tempos too slow for us to notice. So, put differently, climate change denial is based in part on a persistent refusal to include humanity inside the deep flux of artificial planetarity. A refusal to see ourselves as part of this flow, as part of the, as the sort of the effects of this structure, to maintain this dis differentiation, so as to protect, so as to protect a worldview that gives our culture, our narratives, an outsized particular meaning that allows them to continue to project themselves onto the world anthropomorphizing things in, the, in this animistic way. Um, this can work in a few different ways. One, the conviction that worlds cannot actually be altered, that can't, this climate change thing cannot be real, because uh, it cannot be altered because what is, is, what allows, uh, is what allows the idea that we are not now altering the planet because we can't. The idea is like it's not possible to do this. Or in another variation, that if it is alter, it's being altered, and this is in some extent more the um, some of the more conservative religious objections to this as well, that it's not possible for this transformation to take place. It's only possibly some sovereign, you know, some supernatural entity that could possibly do this. It's not even don't even worry about it. Or that any transfigure, or that if it is being altered, that any transfiguration of its properly timeless homeland is a perversion. And so the problem is not the kind of climate change that we have. It's not the problem that the climate change we have is not viable, it's not sustainable, but that it is change at all. That it's an introduction to an artificial premise at all. That things should be put back, put back where they are, where they were before the, before the bad things happen, before the Anthropocene. So put directly, the anti-Copernic, and this has been a summary of this with the Husserl, the anti-Copernican sentiment that denigrates abstraction, alienation, and materiality, all very good things, so as to venerate an organic dwelling on an essential cultural ground in sight of an experientially intuitive horizon is not just what leads to climate change denial, it is climate change denial. It's a definition of climate change denial. So, perhaps paradoxically, despite um, despite its stubborn anthropocentrism, some expressions of this kind of humanism might refute the significant the re refute that human signification affects world scale beyond the boundary of what is called culture, that in fact everything we're doing sort of remains in here nevertheless, and that we can make culture about those phenomenon, but that the culture that we make is in fact not that phenomenon itself. Yeah, this is part of the self-protection of the representationalism. Um, even, while, uh, even while sometimes also keeping that humans are positioned centrality within this divine, in some kind of divine narrative. So such that when design does trespass across that boundary into what is supposedly nature, making seedless apples, I suppose, um, it is accused of playing God, because God is the thing that is supposed to actually act in this way and at this sort of scale. There's another boundary that is being transgressed and structured in this way, even a articulated by apparently secular uh, responses to to this uh, responses to this as well that there's a a fundamentally impure degradation of these processes to work it's not just a not just a a kind of a pragmatic argument that says maybe we don't quite know the ultimate the effects of this and maybe we shouldn't do that because we don't know what the effects are, but rather the doing that in and of itself is is the uh, is is a kind of is is the problematic kind of structure the trend even a kind of transgression so, 
Here's the here's your bumper sticker. Very, if you have a very large car. Climate change denialism is based in part on a persistent refusal to include humanity inside the deep flux of artificial planetarity, so as to protect a worldview that gives our culture, our culture a particular meaning. The conviction that worlds cannot be altered is what allows the idea that we are not now altering the planet because we can't, or in another version, that if it is being altered, that any transgression whatsoever, transfiguration whatsoever is the pro of this properly timeless homeland is a perversion. The problem is that any change is artificial at all. Importantly, the inverse of this is equally true. Not only is the denial of climate change a refusal, but the refusal is also a denial. The anti-Copernican sentiment that denigrates abstraction, alienation, materiality, so as to venerate an organic dwelling on the central cultural ground inside of an experientially intuitive horizon is not just what leads to climate change, it is climate change denial, it is climate change denial itself. Now, um, back to measurement for a moment. The question then is, 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 is another way of sort of zooming out here back to this question of the artificial planetarity um, and, the, and the identification, indexing, and measurement of that change and of that transformation, trying to conceptualize the scope and effect of that artificiality by measuring its traces. Right? We measure, there is a transformation, there is a, this sort of headless geoengineering and climate engineering process that we've taken, we've taken place over the course of the Anthropocene. We measure that through particular uh, charismatic indexes, like CO2 parts per million. But those are measurements, they're measurements of actual facts, but those facts themselves are sort of, uh, they, they signal a whole range of other kinds of transformations that have taken place that would result in that. Right? They're, 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 are, they are indicative traces um, ar around this as well. Um, and so the, the, that ability to identify and even comprehend the scope of that anthropogenicness, which is both the foreground and, uh, and, and background here as well, is again one of the things that the stack has provided to us. You're welcome. Um, that, so again, if asked in isolation, the question of how can planetary scale computation contribute to conceptual shifts and applied interventions in and against climate change it fails to ask this question in isolation, fails to see that climate change, quote unquote, itself is an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. It's in its embryonic form, that is, in the embryonic form of the stack. The accidental megastructure was used for many things for global weather modeling in the phase in the 70s and the development of Earth sciences and the astronomic modeling, the turning in of the external view of NASA to the internal view of the Earth, the discovery of the Earth as the planet, and so forth and so on. The notion of climate change, quote unquote, is an empirically validated pattern drawn from a comprehensive planetary scale biopolitical sensing, surveillance, modeling, and calculating apparatus. So. Perspective, so perspectives such as this are uh, understandable on a certain kind, on, on, on a certain set of level, uh, in that they sort of represent something that should people should have figured out a long time ago. That is, computation is a physical fact; it's not virtual. Digitality is not virtual any more than you know. Analog to physical, digital to virtual was a you know a conceptual mistake that we continue to pay for. There's nothing immaterial about computation. So the, the disclosure that all of a sudden that computation actually has physical sourcing, that it's made out of minerals, that it requires electrical, so that it's a massive globe wrapping in wire mega infrastructural project should not be in 2020 a scandal. Somehow expose revealed. It's, it should be common sense in a certain sort of way. The thing that we need, the question is, again, to the excellent question asked earlier, what do we use it for? What do we use it for? What is it being trained on? It does have enormous ecological, environmental costs. It is, it is itself a terraforming project. Toward what end? This is the, this is the, um, this is the question. So that you know this what we this this most artificial 
significant artificial abstraction is, is made legible and communicable, is made into a communicable concept in this way. The shift in infrastructural scale technical cognition that is the, that surveillance apparatus that brings us the notion of climate change, um, that allows us to conceive the world in this way, in a more direct but counterintuitive way, is not only a means to mitigate climate change, it's how we know it's happening at all. Um, so as, as already mentioned, the implications should of this should force, I think, further transformations in how we understand these interlocking relationships of agency and so forth and so on. So now to the, the plan. The, for better or worse, the planned economy never went away. Um, and neither did uh, the planned ecology. Uh, after the end of Keynesianism and so forth. Both of them evolved into architectures of uh, what we call today platform economies, platform uh, mechanisms. Amazon, Samsung, Huawei, Walmart. These are planned economies. They're internal structured planned economies. They operate according, they are not autocatalytic, autopoetic phenomena. They are planned with military scale rigor. They set prices. They do all of the things that a planned economy would sort of structure. The generating price signals, logistical imperatives, material assembly, extraction markets, distribution rationales, and so forth and, and, and so forth and so on. They are artificial economies in sort of this way. But they are, in many ways, uh, as we would see, uh, mostly not the plans we need. So however, planned economies and ecologies as they exist have been optimized for very different goals than the viable planetarity as we might identify. What qualifies as a viable planetarity and for this project is, is probably something else up to from this 10 year gap between now and the 2030 uh, deadline uh, is something like, as we said, to kind of revert the entropy of the last, of the last few years. So a few of that words on behalf of the very idea of planning. Um, things will never go exactly according to plan, which is, in fact, kind of part of the plan. Um, but the, this, the notion that the plan systems in which we work now appeared only through a kind of bottom-up acephalic emergence, acephalic meaning headless, that and that spontaneity is always better than planning, that decentralization is always better than centralization, that improvisation is always better than, um, you know, than, than, than uh, repetition and deliberation, and so forth and so on, need to give way to something more deliberately composed in relationship to what constitutes the viability of that planetarity, that, that which inevitably means something that is both top down and bottom up, whatever that means, um, but most something would reopen the significance and, and reference of what those positions even mean in relationship to each other. Um, and I think it's probably a lack of architectural imagination that causes us to fall back on those kinds of, that kind of simple positionality. So in other words, nobody panics when things go according to plan, like the, funny, like the joker said, um, but now we should be panicking to the extent to which there actually is no plan. So one of the guest speakers that will be, there'll be a few guest speakers who are going to be speaking to this question of the of the um, the reincorporation of the planned economy, the ways in which some of the the, the genealogy of the capitalist platforms within uh, socialist and communist planned systems, uh, that the ways in which this paired genealogy suggests the uh, the kind of um, potentially amphibious. Uh, politically amphibious directions by which these kinds of structures may in fact uh, be going um, that we'll be working with uh, will be in which to in many of us will will in the question of the urbanism will try to revolve around uh, a, 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 con a notion of a ecologically sort of ecologically intelligent viable urbanism. Um, as one that is 
fundamentally attentive to that chemical, the chemical, the metabolism structure by which all, of, but which is inclusive of the, the primates that live in the, uh, the primates that live in the city, and that that culinary composition of that of that uh, chemical metabolism uh, may be one that would want to introduce a maximum amount of efficiencies and intensivity so as to reduce the externalities of waste and other forms of violence that would ensue from this as well. And so it's to these kinds of hyper-efficient logics of the object that we may want to find a, a way to commandeer and retrain towards, towards something else. Instead of uh, platforms that are trained to obsess with the identitarian specificity of individual persons, the calculations of profiles for those individual persons to predict what they may wish to, what they are most likely to desire. Next. The individual person is the absolute wrong base unit of planetary scale computation. The fundamental pathology of planetary scale computation is this, it's coordination around the, the notion that the individual person is the, really the most fundamental uh, base unit here. Uh, and towards or something else. So, so here it goes. To, this is a little bit on this question of the geochemistry and the geopolitical. This as well, and has to view maybe sort of thinking it through this question of where does that, the possibility of that enforcement come from, to sort of turn this around. So, at least after um, the work of Carl Schmidt, the German political theorist, not very nice guy. Um, sovereignty, the notion of sovereignty, like that which is the, the political sovereign that would have the ability to enforce the plan, is understood not just as, and this speaks a little bit as a kind of qualification of my answer to your question about agency and positionality, is not just um, that which occupies the executive position within the normal org chart when things are operating normally. The true sovereign within the political is he or she or it who can suspend the normal state of things and declare a state of emergency, if you like. To that which we can say the, the regular situation is in abeyance. It is now the state of exception. All the normal rules don't apply. We have emergency orders. In effect. Whoever can decide the state of exception not the decide the norm, this not sort of decide that there's an order, is the sort of fiction of the true sovereign. So there's this link within Schmidian theory, which obviously has this, has been taken up by different political theorists on both the right and the left, and I think to some extent is, is part of the, I would include to some extent part of this, what I'm calling this political reductionism uh, of notion as well. It, it, he is mostly responsible for the, when people use the political with a capital P, uh, as if it has this, this kind of uh, status in the sense it comes from this world. But the part of this that's interesting to us is this linking of the, of the, so the, sovereign the sovereignty as this condition of decision with the emergency and the declaration of the state of emergency. And the question we ask in the sense is to what extent that, um, how pliable is this as well? Um, we might ask like why is it that you know, if we have the technical means to deal with this, these, these issues, we have the political means, we have the financial means, we, we actually have the things at stake that would be necessary to undertake the kinds of transformations that are necessary. What we don't have is an enforcement mechanism that says this is what's going to happen now as opposed to the other things that are now no longer going to happen. Um, it is, in that sense, it is a, if you want to think of it this way, there is, it is a political problem um, uh, that is getting in the way of the, that is a geopolitical, uh, um, a, a, a kind of geopolitical catastrophe that is getting in the way of the rolling out of the geotechnical interventions that w might be, that might be, uh, that might be needed. Um, and so we, we might ask the inversion of this. It's not just that emergencies are declared by sovereign positions. We also see very much the other way around that the appearance of sovereign comes from the emergency. That the emergency produces its own 
sovereign positions in relationship to in relationship to to itself, uh, in relationship to the the, the hyper practical requirements of that particular motion. As the seats get rearranged, um, that the things that need to get decided about change. And as the things that get to need to be decided about change, there's new positions, new positions, new agencies. So, um, I, I'll put it this way: I think that for the for the scope and plan of the of the plan of the planetarity needed, I would say I would suggest in a just in a purely predictive way that it's highly unlikely that the necessary appropriate alternative would be that we would need, what the geopolitics that we would need would look like. Extremely unlikely, get, again, get to the point we, we were talking before the, but whether or not it's even possible for this geotechnology to exist and to be rolled out and to be, to be employed given the current political and economic structure that we sort of have. I think we're extremely unlikely that, it, that, that, that the geopolitics we would need for that to happen would be predicated on the inviolability of individual voice, property, settlement, language, identity, consumptive desire as the sources of a commanding general will. More likely, emphasis will shift from technologies that allow for, is that bad news? No, it just sounds like what we discussed. Oh, it did. OK, good, 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 good. OK, good, good. Um, more likely, the emphasis would turn from technologies that allow for what, negative liberty, that enforce negative liberty. People can, the, the, an organization think people can do what they want, um, to ones that ensure what, what positive liberty, that future devastation will be prevented. So in, in this sort of legal, positive, negative liberty refers to the conditions by which your people are able to do what they like unless there is some prohib prohibition to it. Um, the, what's called positive liberty refers to like there is, a, there is a, an, an intervention or structure in place to ensure that um, the, the, the good thing happens or that the uh, violence isn't done to uh, any, of the, any of the other sort of people. So, one this, you can see this way is that the object of the political, the object of politics. I mean, from the French Revolution, from the Greek democracy, the French Revolution, the socialist experiments, all of them are refer to a kind of biopolitics um, that may be based in one way on the identification and organization of human bodies but also actions and opinions, that the general will, that the proper fraction of the political is the representation of the general will, the voice of the, of the, the ideas of the people. Um, shifts from a political that is based on the idea of, a, of the capture and mediation of the general will to one that is more interested in flows of biochemistry, energy, as the geopolitical, as the bi geo biopolitical reference to be given form and qualities. So imagine a ge in a certain sense, what I'm saying, imagine geopolitics is predicated not on what are the institutional media by which we can uh, we can properly uh, we, we can properly survey, communicate, capture, and amplify what it is that the primates think that that's fundamentally the basis of what of the condition of enforcement to one that is interested more in the, it, it, that is the reference to one that is more on, on the, the actual one that is interested instead on a the the these flows of, of directly of biochemistry and energy itself where the opinions and ideas of the primates are maybe important uh, maybe need to be protected, but they're not the object by which the political is derived. It is a biopolitics in the Foucault and Agamben sense, if you like. In this sense, their biopolitics is all about the over-individuation of the body, the measurement and, and disciplining of the 
these individual bodies in one way or another. The production and the production and subsequent extraction of a subjectivity from the bodies. This is a different biopolitics. Uh, one that isn't that that body is no longer the is no longer the central referent. If that were to come to pass, um, speaking of the provincialization, if that were to come to pass, then many of those vernacular traditions of political traditions of what we call the West would, by definition, need to give way to a different kind of more pragmatic universal materialism, because those those flows themselves are not. Um, uh, don't have the same kind of home. So, wrapping this up, even if we see, even as we see the political and the technological converge in a way at this scale, the principles by which the quote the political is defined in relationship to decision and exception, so and so on, remains, but it is twisted in a different way. Um, the sovereign then is not only that which can, can, can proclaim the moment of emergency has arrived, but also that which is the emergency produces in its own image. Um, and the sovereign that the emergency produces in its own image is this question, what if climate change is an emergency, what are the sovereign positions that would emerge in its image? Again, the hypothesis is the likely sovereign to emerge in its image would not be a form of politics that is predicated on the surveying of will of the primates, not that this isn't unimportant, but that its, its primary interest in its object of governance and enforcement is a different assemblage. It's a, it's a different scale. It's a, it's a planetary, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a climatic scale operation. So um, again, to it, is, is there any position in what is currently even thought of as the, what we think of as the political uh, the institutions that we have that is even capable of declaring that this is, 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 is an emergency. Is there a government form that in, inside of which or adjacent to which in relation to which there currently exists someone somewhere or something somewhere that has the capacity to act as that Schmidian sovereign and say, this is an emergency, this is a state of exception, this other org chart is, is on pause, this is the emergency kind of structures that matter. No, not really. If there was a sense that, in a way, it would have appeared already. Or if it has, it, if it has in one way or another, we're, if we're swimming in, instead in a surplus of declarations of emergency, that don't actually have the capacity to instigate that state of exception, that they are just gestures, um, then it doesn't matter. Or it does, it's the same thing as if no, that position didn't exist in the first place. Because again, we have the means, financial means, logistical means, all the rest of this to meaningful address this, but we don't have is that, is that structure. So, you can think of it this way. The geopolitics of the emergency may eventually, that may be declared, may look, well, look quite different than what Schmidt or others would have recognized as being the political. Instead, the chain of determining representation that is the, the basis of the sort of conventional models of modern politics that flows from a legal declaration, which is then reflected in the technical apparatus. First, there's the general will. Then the general will is codified in a law. Then the law produces that, that that roll out of the Jews, so forth and so on. Perhaps instead the sovereign that emerges from this emergency, that is created from the emergency, looks more like a technical apparatus than it does a geopolitical one. One in which that is subsequently, retroactively indexed as legal, is made legal, civilization of this as well. The sovereign that emerges may not be a a he or her thing, it may be an it. So, last point on this, um, which has to do with this, this, the implications a little bit of this shift in this relationship of the political and the technical, and then we'll open for discussion. Just as any technology emerges in an ecological and geological context, um, polity does as well. 
one of the problems with this metaphysicalization of the political, where we get from the Schmidian consciousness of this as well, is, is not only the arm's length by which it understands the relationship to technicity, it's also the, the fantastic ignorance that it enforces about the technicity and the possibility of its own emergence. That the political, the mechanisms and media of that polity itself are ones that are effects of that particular kind of, a, a particular form of a, a technical history. And it's it, a more I think, literate form of historical political science be one that is more attentive to that kind of process. And you're beginning to see this, um, I think. You, you, you just see this more and more, and or sort of earlier on. Weber, for example, even sort of the beginning of political sociology was quite attentive to this. To this, to this fact. However, many of the current mo models of the political as the sort of the basis of the response that we have from both the left and the right can't approach this, I think, without really tying themselves, um, tying themselves in, in knots. The first decision then in with any of the structures, it has to do with, with, with the ways in which any polity structure is always what's inside the polity at all, what's inside or, what's inside or outside. Um, so, in practice, if not in theory, um, the, nom the geonomos, the multi the, what we called earlier, uh, specifies not only the ways in which it's possible to subdivide the Earth into jurisdictional units over which political particular institutions have their sort of limited, uh, limited uh, capacity for decision. It also has to do with the regularization of how when and where an expected or unexpected decision is located, which allows others to organize their interest in anticipation of a reliable chain of command, supply, and relay. This, I'll unpack this in a second. This is basically another way of addressing the question that you were asking before about agency, agency and automation. Another way to define the political in this sort of context is is that process by which those positions within that regular chain of the sort of, of the cascading relay, that's, that the, the, the solution or decision that, um, that will filter or fork or determine or steer something through this, through this chain, that how certain positions are regularized or Dis or dysregularized or, or left irregular, um, how the interest or organization in, 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 in the certain anticipation is really where the what we the form of the political that we, I think we'd want to hold on to um, remains. But it's one that has to do with the specification, not only of which people are able to decide which things at what time, but also which technical systems are deciding which thing at one time. If part of the Polity of automation that has this 2030 uh, deadline looming has to do with the substitution of humans and machines within the same relay. That if you had the same automated relay and there's a certain point in it where which there's a human that is doing a, either a non a, a task in which they have no capacity for decision, they're simply putting one brick on top of another, or that has a capacity for decision is replaced by a a technical mechanism that has a capacity for decision or no capacity for decision. This displacement and replacement suggests that, in fact, that political decision for organizing this regularization is one that is equally uh, is equally trained on both the um, the people and the things. Um, now, last point, properly last point. Um, How all of these entanglements work includes, again, what may or may not be recognizably political. The models set limits on how the political is thought. So in this, in, the decision may be hardwired into a chain of mediated relays that work the same regardless of whether the first domino is toppled by a king, a priest, or people's assembly. Again, the, that planetary geochemistry is essentially agnostic as to what the political form of its transformation may be. This does not, however, exhaust us from spending a lot of energy debating the necessary qualities of that proper first domino pusher within the chain. 
that because there is this, it, it may be is symptomatic, if you like, because there is this intense presumption that the really sort of the proper seat of agency is within the 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 subjective externalization of the of, of the proper idea. That the presumption is that the the outcome that we want has to be pre-modeled in that first idea that would set in motion this relay. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later in terms of what I call the avatar theory of political represent avatar theory and political rep representation. The t what we should be focusing on instead is is the is as opposed to focusing on on debating the necessary qualities and identities of the proper first domino pusher, it should be it, it should be on conceiving better relays. It should be on working backwards from that structure to the outcome in ways in which those components can be, are, are, as they are already uh, substituted from one another, can continue to be. And so this last point, we will, and then we'll open it up. The plan that we find ourselves um, sitting in front of entails the simultaneous emergence of an artificial geopolitics that resembles what we would today recognize as a planetary scale geotechnology, a geo an emergence of an artificial geopolitics that from today's perspective we would recognize as being a geotechnology, and vice versa, of artificial geotechnologies that resemble what we today would recognize as a planetary scale geopolitics. And I'll talk a little bit more um, the ways later on um, the, the, about the, the arrangement of these together, again, and, and tying this back to why we should allow for the, the, the precedence of the geotechnological to, make, to allow for the shape of that, that artificial geopolitics to come. OK, so that's enough for discussion. Um, we've got two more days, so we'll have many more things to Discuss. Let's let's use the remaining time to try to um, make some toys out of what we put on the table in this in this second session. So I will so invite uh, invite questions, comments, or other forms of verbal outbursts. Okay, thank you. So it was a bit closer to the beginning about art, uh, anomal anomalous anomalous regular regularity. Yeah. Yes. Seems um, like yesterday. There was a thin yeah. image of the, sorry. What? Seems like yesterday, but yes, yes, okay, yes, yes. <laughs> long time ago. Uh, so there was this forest with circles, yep. and I would like to make a remark. If we have the image, would be good. Um, do we have this image of the forest, or is it together? Uh, uh, okay. You, you want to make you want to make your po you want to make your point. Of um, using, while kind this of yes. Yeah, I'd, sure. I don't one, know exactly. Uh, automatic for the people. I don't know exactly if it's. <laughs> If the whole forest is artificial or not, I just would like to pay attention that even if it looks like you say hickety pickety or what was it, uh, that the rest looks a bit like random, and regular actually opposite of regular is irregular, and actually it's not. And I would just like to point it out that it's like uh, I don't know civilization one thousand regularity happening there because it all depends on the soil the mm -hmm. wind the sun and everything yep just and actually those circles are less regular because they come from someone's mind and idea to make them circles they could be triangles or whatever rectangles if you know what i mean it's like art. Well, that's kind of the point i think I, I i don't know if they're less regular but the point i would strongly agree with is that it's not is, is that actually the the other things the background structure though is the, is is not only also regular mm -hmm. uh and that um but it depends it, it, on but, what you call regular yes. right right the, the 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 background trees are more entropic that there's mm -hmm. there's actually less ordering going on in the background trees than there is in the sort of foreground trees but the point i would want to hold on to sort of here as well is is, the, is that that background landscape that we see there was a is most likely a an earlier artificial intervention mm -hmm. may have been a tree farm so yeah. as well that this this landscape design and terraforming process by which uh, homo sapiens have occupied territories. It's been going on for a really, really long time. And the greatest thing is like a lot of the things that, that we would be most certainly recognize as being the, the utterly non-artificial 
parts of the world in one way or another are, are entirely, are in one, have been in one way or another there because of some kind of intervention, whether it's the permafrost in Siberia that's there because we killed the mammoths, uh, whether it's or the you know, extraordinarily complex forms of landscape design that many of the Native Americans in the southwest of the U.S. indicated before the span before the Spanish got there, there they had there's a bit, bit very different connotation the idea of, of unspoiled wilderness it wasn't a wilderness for them at all. Yes, uh, but um, I don't know. Maybe just to say that it's just it's also a logic how it happens. Just that it's much more complex than. Agreed. Geometry, that's just what I want to say. Yeah, yeah, for yes. sure. Can you use the microphone so that we can... Um, just yeah, so, so that exactly can, as so you CIA define then the uh, artificial... Get a good transcript. As a way to recognize <laughs> agency by measuring the regularity of its consequential traces. I think yeah. exactly what right. Tatiana that's is right. pointing here, that the agency of the human being that decided to make the circles is actually pretty much the same as the agency of the soil and all the water patterns in the uh, forest around there. So uh -huh. this point of like agencies can be also then it's, yeah, of it's a different very nature. Exactly, yeah. you know, very much agree. Yeah, cool. So very messy, overlapping, conditional, uh, non-exclusive uh, to, to one another, um, for, for, for sure, uh, this as well. All right. no, no, no. But this idea of another way of understanding this relation of agency and the artificial is not only that the artificial is the thing that results from some kind of deliberate, pre preemptive, you know, deliberate sort of act, something some this as well, but it also to this point becomes the basis of the, the echo or trace, the trace is agency. That was the point I was also sort of getting at with the, the way in which planetary scale computation has it has had and its epistemic accomplishment of the notion of climate change. It's a way that there's these in climate change indexes is a way in which we can the, the very abstract notion of anthrop the anthropogenesis uh, is can be seen as sort of a, this sort of the trace. And so traces and shadows and echoes and imprints are all good things. Uh, what kind of concept do we need? Because, like for instance, uh, Anthropocene his own has his own uh, good sides yeah. and his own also downsides also. Anthropocentrism. And, and yeah, yeah. Anthropocene. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. And uh, especially the concept of division. Yeah, uh, culture, nature doesn't work mm -hmm. really, but we still need this kind of division, especially in land. It's our city or nature. I mean. On well, kind of one h habitat, non-habitat, yeah. like black factor is other, and how exactly like to not over simplify, over simplify everything, but still convey into some common sense. Um, well, I think I I hope that's I I've, I've given I hope to some extent I've given a long uh, answer or at least a lead into the answer. Th this afternoon, but I, 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 in terms of the the land use question, um, I, I want to uh, agree with you strongly that part of the land planning uh, approach should be one in which we entertain the idea of not building everything everywhere, and that to a greater degree, as much of the planet that we can make into a park as possible would be an ideal outcome. Not because it's nature, but because it's not. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's this is this this is the, the sort of point. The idea that by this dismantling of the nature culture code that, that somehow al allows for a the, per, the an infinite permission for the things that are identified as culture to have to become ubiquitous is not necessary is not at all a necessary a necessary uh, domain. But are you asking just a more sort of direct question? It's like, if it's no longer the nature culture divide that has this foundational fulcrum within commonsensical thought about where we are and what we're doing, what does? Yeah, I'm asking more about the like, term itself, concept itself, how we should call things 
because things are kind of well, very complicated. <laughs> like there give, is give abstraction. Me, give me a say. thing, I'll, I'll tell you what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here, just one question. Yeah. Um, I saw on the, uh, on the stack this yeah. uh, idea that um, the concept of autonomous is like a combination of nomos and automation. Could you elaborate a little bit? No, auto, nomos, self, self governing. Self governing. Auto as in self, nomos as in governing. So autonomous is, would be, is the idea of something that is self self governing. Um, so I would, uh, and part of the way in which I think we're talking automation, is a term that comes much later, um, not really until with the Ford Motor Company's assembly line. It's a, a notion from the 1940s, I think, of the management speak. Um, but aut autonomy, I mean, one of the ways, the automation that we're talking about in this relation to this autonomy, part of the argument we're making is that, is that this, the aut apparent autonomousness of things that are automated is 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 in certain important sense illusory that the things that have been automated such that this thing can continue to act without decision it does not have to continuously make a new decision every time it encounters instant 1 instant 2 instance 3 instance 4 instance 5 it is predecided what's being automated is that precedent decision and so it's the thing that appears to be self-governing is anything but self-governing. It's in fact a repetition of a codification and repetition of a precedent decision. Yeah, artifactualization, if you like. Uh, hi. Yeah. So. Um I have a question. So uh, you were talking about individual person as the wrong base for planetary scale computation? Yes. Uh, wrong base unit. OK, so that was one point you made. And another point in the first half uh, was about, um, OK. Yeah, so basically here uh, we are talking about the wrong unit. But uh, again, if you look at the economic systems and how they are extracting this individual uh, kind of uh, person mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. their economic systems, right. like data and yeah. all that thing around it. Yep. So basically it's like a cycle. They are exploiting it and mm -hmm. trying to make more out of it. And uh, in the morning when we were talking about like... Uh, the temperature is currently higher and we need to reduce it by any like any how mm -hmm. by any means necessary. like yeah, yeah. Uh, but like which means it's regardless but i think they're kind of not, not entirely but mo it's, yeah. mo it's more regardless than we might think yeah it's not a matter of making sure we have the exact perfect right domino pusher yeah. in place and therefore we can guarantee the outcome we want that's not how anything works exactly and along with it there was another point which is like the climate change denial or any denial or any yeah. kind of perception anybody has for that matter <laughs> so everything is like interlinked like okay yeah. i have an idea and somebody else has some kind of other idea sure uh, so if we are like um, saying that uh, individual person is the wrong unit of planetary scale computation um, then but how base, do we base unit base unit yes uh, if it's like the wrong base unit uh, the then how do we like uh, carry forward our ideas to other people and like how well, do we you tell them about it also? You, you just said that ideas are the 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 this, the, the function or circulation of ideas is 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 trans individual if you yes. have an idea, I have an idea, yes, we have exactly. an idea but together, like, so she makes the idea better, so the idea is there, the, blah, blah, blah. The, the whole point is that it's trend individual. Idea yeah. is the content, the media that is uh, passing back and forth, yeah. but like we also need a medium yeah. for the transfer of it, which is uh, like this entire mechanism for uh, planetary scale computation of sorts. Sure. Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting, we, I'm not at all suggesting that we get rid of planetary scale computation. I'm suggesting that it's, it's the fact that of all of the things that it could be trained on, yes. that it could be trained to do, yes. that it has already historically been trained to do from weather modeling to yes. science to traffic modeling, I mean, all the kinds of things that to do. 
the fact that the thing that is, to your point, it's most, it is be used for the most intensively, the greatest economic and even geologic impact is, is in the modeling of individuated, the prediction of individuated subjectivity is not necessary, the, the only way it can be done. And I'm arguing it's actually quite pathological. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So there, are, so the question is like, yes, we need this, but it's like, what are the other possible, what are the other possible objects and reference that it, that that can be, uh, that can be sense model index calculated? We have lots and lots of examples of, of of other things that could sort of could be done in this sort of regard. And so the, I was simply saying that there's an, another kind of, if you like, not necessarily disanthropocentrism of computation, that it's no longer so much focused entirely only on the whims and desires of, 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 of humans, but more importantly, a disindividuation of, the, of, of, the, of, this, of this process. That, 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 that this, it's the hyper-individuation of this process that has these extraordinary distortion effects around this as well. And I think that it even ends up going to sort of like the ways in which the, you know, that you can think of it in terms of automation and adaptive systems. When, you've got, when you have one node in a system, that has all the ability to sort of recirculate its input back to its sort of output, it ends up, you get these kinds of closed loop functions that don't actually scale or work and render this sort of as well. And that's, I think, what we've, what, where we're at at a certain sort of point is that we've, we've produced seven billion um, circular funhouse mirror closed loop uh, persons. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about these concepts like Gaia, object oriented ontology, or symbiotic real and division between not nature and culture. So I read a book by an anthropologist with the name of Philip Descola. Yeah. And uh, uh, he started tribes in Amazon. And uh, my question is aren't we going back to the ancient times? Because like these Amazon tribe, tribes have had animisms of everything or like totemisms of everything. So they did not really divide nature and culture because all everything was nature. Right. Because uh, they like lived very close to the territories, uh, for example, in the forest. And they w were really dependent on these forests uh, or the, their like, climate circumstances. We're so just, are, we're just, we, and we're just as dependent as we ever were. The idea that somehow we, we, we somehow the moderns like to think that we've become less dependent on the geological substrate, but we're just as dependent. I mean, but I what I mean, that, that yep. humanity already passed this, that period of time. Aren't we just rephrasing like linguistically all these concepts? No. No. Um, so I know that I know Descola has spoken, I know around this as well. And so my remark around the animism was specifically sort of targeted at that it is, and, and Arturo Escobar and others in the anthropological trend within anthropology, which I find to be interesting as anthropology, the way in which it's been taken up in a sort of secondary literature to be um, t deeply irresponsible in other ways as well. The, the nature culture, the absence of a nature culture divide that, that Descola describes, and he's also describing a number of very specific groups of people in very specific kinds of cultures that others in the West like to amplify and to represent all indigenous cultures as if that's somehow, as if there's something like coherent about all of these and singular and monolithic about indigenous cultures, which is another kind of um, sort of difficult, uh, 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 problematic maneuver. But to your point, this, the, the absence of the nature culture divide that he identifies in these sort of particular groups and sort of generalized as this sort of, um, um, uh, with this kind of condition, sometimes you know, identified as part of this prelapsarian uh, Eden to sort of go back to, is an example in many respects, at least of the way Descola describes it and the ways it should be taken up, as part of this um, what we've sort of earlier is about this kind of an, the animistic projection. The reason that the mountain and the forest and the frog and the tree and the rest of this and the human in it and the things that the human eats and the rest of it are all part of a kind of, uh, as, as a part of a, of, a, of a continuity is because in many words, they're understood as being part of a narrative continuity that is predicated on forms of anthropomorphic projection of these entities within the system 
that have very little to do with the actual materiality or even real biochemical agency of these systems, but rather upon their narrative personif rather upon the narrative personification. Seeing the world as entirely a screen onto which our, our own uh, our, our uh, organizing narratives can be projected is not anti-anthropocentric. It's not disanthropocentric. It's hyperanthropocentrism. It's hyperanthropocentrism. That frog is this character. That mountain is this character. That tree is this character. This object is this has this ritual significance. And I'm not I'm not specifically speaking saying that that these groups in the in, in Brazil and, and Amazon, the Descalos sort of workers are uniquely um, that use, exhibit this tendency and uniquely. I think it's it's absolutely right here as well. Um, but no, for, is that the, I would want to draw a, a relatively really sort of sharp distinction between the this the nature culture collapse that we're sort of speaking about here, or the implications of the nature culture that we're speaking about here, versus the what I would think of as, and maybe you have a different perspective on this, what I would think of as a kind of, um, uh, as, as not as a, a de-anthropomorphization, but rather hyper-anthropomorphization. Is, is it clear what I mean? Is, is it clear? To, yeah, is, it clear point, is, is it clear to you what, 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 I, what, 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 I, mean, what I mean? What, is, what is I mean? What I mean? What I mean? approach. So, what? I, I mean more about the approach. So they did not took from the forest, for example, more than they wanted to because they were like very much in, uh, in connection with these like woods. You know, they imagined like as a anthropomorphisms, like trees and like some of everything like an organisms. You know, this is why they treated like very. Uh, like patiently, thoroughly, thoroughly, to the to the nature. So, uh, what 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 do you mean? Uh, as I understand it correctly, so we should like treat like we our kind of if I call it correctly, uh, sure it's not correctly, but uh, <laughs> I I can call it like our animism is like is chemistry. So like our no no man, Chem it's real. Chemistry is real. The actually the world is actually made out of table of elements. Actually. There's actually more hydrogen atoms in the universe than any other kind of hydrogen atom. It's not a text. It's not a text. It's not one ontology equals another ontology. It's just a matter of opinion. There actually, I mean, there chemistry actually as, is as a, a mind independent idea, reality as a, as that a, we actually like, can media access. Category. What? No, I mean, chemistry is a media category, not is as a, a, is a what? Is a media category or like transcendental, like something transcendental, something like that. I don't mean it that way. I mean it really like, like molecules. Like there is actually sort of this there, and it actually operates. This. And there actually, again, there is a mind-independent reality. It is accessible. There are ways in which we can produce conceptual cognitive models of the world that are more or less correspondent to that external world. Heliocentrism is a mental, is a cosmological model that is more correspondent to the geophys to astrophysics of our solar system than. Geocentrism is. It is. I, 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 that, I mean, that's at least my thought on that. I, 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 if there's other people who want to argue for geocentrism, that's another sort of structure of this. Well, no, no, no. I, I wasn't suggesting. I wasn't suggesting that. You, I wasn't suggesting that you were. But um, let me sort of sort of make sure that my point is. I, I, no, please. Okay, but let, let me also try to clarify my point so that I'm not misunderstood. misunderstood and then, it's f certainly fine if we disagree as long as we understand what we're disagreeing if if we disagree about. Um, it's it's no good if we think we disagree but we don't, or we don't agree but we think we do. Uh, both of those are th th those are not sustainable. Um, uh, I think you're quite right that the idea that somehow collapse of nature culture dichotomy that comes from this sort of that there's you know, a particular development and construction of nature as a domain and culture as a domain that are separate from one another that appears super recently in certain parts of 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 the of of, of, of Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and certain North America, stuff like this, in no sense represents the the, the like the, the the comprehensive story of of, of the ways in which humans have thought through this issue, it's not even it's not remotely representative of the of the whole range in which human cultures have sort of th thought through the issue. And so the fact that it's collapsed 
it begins to collapse here and now, it is absolutely 100% a local story. It, it, that it does not stand in for the entirety of so, so human, the, the entirety of, of historical and, and current forms of the ways in which humans have, have, have sort of thought, thought through the issue. No doubt, 100% structure in this as well. Can we then look at other, can we look at, other, at, at, at the whole range of the ways in which human cultures have approached the question of their, uh, the, uh, the co-occupation with the landscape for models, for tricks, for strategies, for discourses that are not understood as going back, that are not archaic, that are super, that are actually just as, that are just as contemporary, just as viable, just as vital as any of the others that we, that we might have, not as a going back, not as a recuperation of a lost, simple, primitive, Edenic ideal, not as some kind of metaphysical amplification of the, of the sort of the pre-modern sort of this as well, but as a contemporary sort of strategy for around this award, 100% absolutely, no doubt, this as well. It, this, this is part, this is part of the premise of the universalism that needs to be composed, right? There's a universalism, there's, you could think of it like there's a universalism that imagines itself as this is this sort of this, this total form that, but that is excluding this whole sort of scope of particulars that it is interesting. And then there's one that in fact includes this particulars as the scope of then this universal, which has this displacement effect on that first Universal, if I'm if sort of being clear as well. So that on that aspect of it, absolutely hundred, absolutely hundred um, percent. And but again, in, it, to the extent that this is understood as a not as a recuperation of the ar archaic around the sort of this as well. Now, at the same time, at the same time, uh, we can we can presume this and think this and act upon it while at the same time still holding that there is such a thing as that there is a mind independent reality that it is possible to produce models of that mind independent reality that are more directly correspondent with the with with that reality and we can even presume that having more accurate models of the world will allow us will is generally better than having less accurate models of, of this sort of the, the, in this sort of structure as well. So I don't think we have to shy away, we don't have to shy away from a criticism or a, a criticism of, of what we would take to be a kind of misapprehension of how it is that the systems sort of work. We don't have to shy away from the implications of those, the disenchantments of those, of those kinds of, of traumas and assume that by doing so that there's a degradation or dismissal of, of those things that just sort of come before. Anyway, that's the sort of, this, this is kind of this point I just wanted to make, yeah. but yeah. Also, chemistry is not a text. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this goes back to some of the earlier questions or um, comments about the subject or the object of design. Yeah. And so this is a, a Mark Fisher quote, so I'm gonna be the first to invoke Mark Fisher, Aww. RIP. Um, <laughs> Which is about like the subject of like what is the exact sort of object or this is like really clarifies for me it's like the same really similar language to the terraforming but it's maybe like a little um, slightly more shorter straightforward yeah um, so I'm just gonna read it and then real quick um, instead of saying that everyone is responsible for climate change we all have to do our bit it'd be better to say that no one is and that's the very problem. Yeah. The cause of eco-catastrophe is an, is an impersonal structure which, even though it is capable of producing all manner of effects, is precisely not a subject capable of exercising responsibility. And finally, the required subject, a collective subject, does not exist. Yet the crisis, like all other global crises we're now facing, demands that it be constructed. And so I take that as sort of like... Um, what we're doing here, like sort of that's the, the point of this, is, it, is to design or construct some subject or some object or some apparatus that's um, capable of designing in this context. And I think what I'm interested in and really uncertain about is the topic of the city as the site for design mm -hmm. of planetarity. Um, or in, in, the, in the same sense, sort of like the question of scale, like sort of opening that a little bit, like what, what are the scales of design um, 
that have the most sort of like direct and efficient impact on the planet. I think that's a really interesting sort of multiple uh, skills. Yeah, I, I think place they, to start. I don't know if there's a question in there, but the comments appreciate it regardless. Um, I think one of the ways in which I think I think. So I, I think I know the, the Fisher quote and around this as well, and I think you're right that there's a fair bit of, of, of overlap around this as well. The part that, I mean, the two aspects of it, that the part of the problem around this is, is that is the, um, this caused by no one, kind of, the, this, this caused by everyone and no one at the, at, at the same time. You, you'll see in some of the discussion we have tomorrow around um, how the ways in which it deals around this question, around the, these issues of, um, of waste and some other kinds of, sort of structures as well, but um, I, I think the basic point is exactly right that there's that the that the um, the political architectures and even the cultural architectures by which models of um, self encapsulated, um, self responsible, um, externally policed uh, legal subjects have been defined. Uh, and have been constructed through the in the liberal era is is utterly inadequate as a way in which to actually understand the the kind the, the the ways in which you would have to design compose and enforce the other kinds of structural interventions at this as well. What the collective I mean Mark I mean I in my discussions with Mark in what way or not they were around the what we meant by the when there's a collective subject I don't know that we entirely had the same kind of. The same kind of ideas there, but I think it's more or less it's it's all it's all fine. Um, the the question of scale though is things that are quite interesting. I think one of the key ways in which we would want to differentiate the notion of the global from the planetary has to do with poly has to do with its polyscalarity. That if we were to take the global in essence as something like that blue mar something like the blue marble image. It is a singular frame of reference. It is, is, it is a totalizing and encapsulating sync sort of frame of reference. But it's one that is operate, that is monoscalular in its, in its perception of those relationships or structure between them. And because it is, it is prone to all manners of and misapprehensions of the relationships between phenomena at multiple and multiple scales. We've been talking about the accumulation of carbon dioxide molecules within the atmosphere. These are very, very small. That th th what planetarity, I think, which we to introduce is something of is something that allows for, um, if not exactly the Eames power of ten kind of sort of neat telescoping arrangement between this as well, but rather to understand that. Operations and interventions of phenomena that operate at a, at a particular scale that their effects are just as likely to be at a radically different scale than the either above or below than the one in which they are held. So the, pro the problem of the powers of 10 model is that these scales are kind of discrete. The scales themselves are not discrete and that they operate sort of across the scale. But hopefully one of the ways in which the que as the question of scale comes in, that it's not a question of like which is the proper scale at which it, but which you design, which never, which automatically means the same thing as which is the proper scale at which we want it further to be in effect, but rather which is the proper scale to design it so that we can imagine an effect at a different scale, and backwards and forwards, and to understand the, the interrelationship and recursivity and indiscreteness between scales um, in, in this way. That would be my initial volley back on that. <clears throat> And also the, just the fact that we're designing media, I think, is really interesting. How do you mean? Quest like topic in that, and we were talking about this a little bit at lunch. Like the the distinction between arguing these points, like like taking a stance on culture versus nature, and having an argument about that versus saying, okay, there's culture, and nature, there's disenchantment, enchantment, there's all these things, and figuring out, debating actually, like us, which one of those actually is a more interesting provocation in the context of media. This is not a question either. What do you it's mean just, in the context of media? Well, just the fact, like what we choose to debate. I'm just thinking about like what we're, what we choose, to, how we choose to spend this time debating culture versus nature, or any of these types of like dialectics versus actually looking at them across the board and saying which one do we think is the more interesting way in. Like you may you may find or think that um, a certain division is less, more or less interesting or provocative, just in the context of of 
us designing mm -hmm. media or doing creative media, like sort of the, that we ourselves are the experiment in terms of designing new, new forms of media in this context, I guess. Is sort of, I still don't know what you mean by d new media in this way. Just you that we're trying like to... The, do you mean like the movies you're going to make? Is yeah. That what you're in, a, in a really okay. straightforward, in a pretty but, straightforward sense. But you don't creative. only have to make movies, too. I mean, sure. There's, it's That's why I say media. You know, you, it's open. I don't, that doesn't need to be... That was originally sort of as a way to to function as a kind of an envelope for a lot of different kinds of research and investigations. It was sort of like the last wrapper by which lots of things can go into, uh, rather than taking as a, as a as sort of a filmic act as well. I think there's a, a sense that there's a, a necessity to take, to develop that filmic capacity better, perhaps so that it works more as a wrapper. But by all means, all of the projects do not have to end up as, as films in this way as well. But I think you're right, but we'll, you'll, we'll have plenty of time. Um, I, I wanted to use, uh, you know, the, wanted to use this first few days together to set some of these foundational conflicts questions actually sort of in place. We're not only going to we by all means will not stay at this level of abstraction all the way through. There'd be no, there's no point. Um, but there has there needs to be a level of I think a kind of orientation inculcation. Yeah. Can I just yeah. add more we, of a we got, comment? We got, time. we got plenty of time. Yeah. It's more of a comment um, because it relates also to this collective subject. I think there is a very good text, I think, from Patricia Reed, which is called uh, Xenophily and Denaturalization, mm -hmm. Computa Computational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know um, this one. Yeah. And I think it, it kind of like also creates this very good distinction uh, about the artificial and the difference in what is given and in what could be in an ontological matter, like it's mm -hmm. very helpful to yep. kind of navigate. Uh, I agree. Uh, I like for that. Yeah. And, and you, should, you, sh you should post it to the slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually saying okay. it yeah, for yeah, yeah. Like, people like if they want to, yeah, yeah. to read it. Um, but also like she brings this, this, this idea of xenophily uh, towards the end in relation to the collective subject. So like instead of going through the homophily kind of logic where we come together uh, with things that we recognize or like likes, breeds, likes, etc., and creates this echo chamber, it actually, we need like this kind of alienation and xeno uh, uh, creation of this collective subject. So it's not even like a collective subject created by equals, but actually collective subject created by like difference and plurality. So I think it's yeah, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And by disorientation. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I think there's a, uh, I think there's a clear link between the, the productive function of technical alienation as she describes it, and that we were talking about in relationship to this, Copernican control as well. So, mm -hmm. yep. I have a question Agreed. about yeah. kind of the level of design. Please. Um, to, kind of to the question, where do the cities go? And we've touched a little on the idea of. Um, if we consider the city as a kind of entity in itself, a kind of geopolitical city or a geotechnical city. Uh -huh. um, and in response to some of the other questions, there's kind of a notion of a world park or a left to be kind of zone. And because I wonder- it's, Because it's not nature. Of course, yeah, yep. we're all part of the same yep. um, automated system now. <laughs> no, but I wonder, um, is the design project kind of that left alone space as much as it is where the cities should go? Is it really Can kind be. of leave the cities to be where they are? And I guess for me it's it, something... It would be just as much, yeah. No, I think, I think it, just to be clear, like when yeah. I said because it's not nature, means that it's not background. It's not city foreground yeah. vegetation But then why background. do we say where should the cities go? Is it not kind of where should the cities end or... Well, where the cities go would be inclusive of where should the cities not go. Mm. Uh, would be part of this kind of question. And that's not the only question we're allowed to sort of... That, no, no, so of course. Should sort of ask. It's kind of sort of initial... But to the general question of the, the absences, yeah. subtractions... I mean, uh, for me, it's kind of a... Elision, a hun absolutely, yes. ...concept of yes. national parks, and in particular at home in the mo at the moment, this idea that, you know, if you kind of leave a space to be in the case of national parks in Australia right now, they yep. just ended up being the most vulnerable states, like the places that were kind of left to be, and then you see this 
kind of resurgence in an idea yeah. of kind of indigenous engineering of landscape. They're not outdoors. That's I mean, they're not outside. Mm. I mean, this was, I think, part of the, became painfully clear in relationship to the, the sort of Australian sort of things, as, as opposed to this, the English lands, the gentlemanly English landscape notion of the park as the outside, the part where we can somehow delink the dirty things we do over here from the clean things that happen over there. And as long as the fence is intact, uh, that there's some sort of way in which we can, we can make these, we can, we, can, we can separate these from one another, that, that literally that nature culture on this kind of sort of divide. So when I say this, left alone because it's not nature, um, it, also as an inclusive, I think this is a notion is that it's, like it's still, it's just as much part of this it, it's just as much part of this planetary, it's just as much part of the planetary ecosystem which is artificial as, as anything else. Not because it's just as susceptible to heat, that it's a giant carbon sink that can catch on fire, all these kinds of things as well. It's not, it's not outside of anything. It's just, it's just as inside and ju perhaps just as vulnerable, um, just as vulnerable for those, region, for, for those reasons. Or you know. well, maybe that because it's like left to be wild by a kind of misunderstood intention, it's even more susceptible to kind of damage. It could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. You know, there's a passage in Holly Buck's, Holly Jean Buck's book about uh, the Plant a Trillion Trees initiative. You might sort of read the word that, you know, you can vary. There was a sort of a, uh, an initiative, I think, last year, with, you know, for this much amount of money, we could plant one trillion trees, the amount of CO2 you know, that these trees were, that would absorb immediately, that would be held in this as well, would have this tremendous, this carb, it would be this hugely, hugely effective and inexpensive carbon capture initiative that would also have positive effects on soil, all the rest of the social things as well. Um, and it, it's true as far as it goes in, in, in a sense, but, you know, to, is that, you know, these, um, even that many trees, they once they're full, they can't absorb any more, uh, and that's it. Uh, and once and also once they're full, they are, like we saw with the Australian sort of wilderness, um, susceptible to releasing it all at once. Which is what we saw with Australia. There, it, just, it was a massive, massive carbon release in the burning of this as well. So not only was it caused by this carbon things, it itself was the carbon release, which will cause the next one, and, and so forth, and so forth, and so on. And so there has to be, I mean, this is also, you get it in this as well, is that is, I mean, just, I'm extending a little bit sort of from the point. But yet, you're exactly right. That even though this is put in this sort of external thing, that the, the notion of the park is somehow protected, or somehow innocent, or, or that this would be better off, is, is something that we're not starting from. And again, it's sort of outside, outside of, outside of not, uh, not an outside in this way. Um, uh, sorry, last my point. We'll go on to the next one. I was going to say something else. I'll, I'll blurt it out. I guess then just to turn it into a question because yeah, you know, this idea of go ahead. the park that's not nature. How do how do we start to imagine that space and how do we start to imagine agency for that yeah. space? Well, we might need another term for it. Park might be the wrong, the wrong kind of the sort of term. I mean, part of the reason it, it is set aside is because it's actually it it does have other kinds of, um, uh, it, you know, what are called ecological services that it's performing uh, that are ne that are necessary that are just that are you can call them biological you can call them technical you can call them whatever they whatever you whatever you wish to call them but they're part of that they're part of that metabolism and that the protection I mean the a protection of the Amazon rainforest such that it would grow back to its pre-industrial size is also a, a kind of geoengineering initiative it's a passive geoengineering it's not putting sulfide into, into the air, but it, it's, geo it's a geoengineering scale effect. Uh, and so it, it's just as artificial in a certain way. It's not putting sensors on all the trees that are necessary for it to be artificial. You can simply just uh, you know, draw the boundary around it so that it can perform some of those services. It still has this kind of capacity. But I remember the thing that I was going to say. It has to do with the negative emission technologies. So as I mentioned in the book, most all of the you know, the, late, the, the IPC special report from a year and a half ago now um, is sort of very explicit that it's not only that we have to radically cut the amount of, of carbon and heat that are going into the atmosphere, we have to subtract billions of tons of carbon that's already there in order for those cuts to, to have a chance to actually 
to actually work. Um, and so Holly's book is very good on thinking through some of the implications of what that would work, working backwards from the numbers and thinking like, okay, how do you do that? How do you do the billions of something? Like what would actually work? And 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 and, and so forth. And, and, and we don't have a lot of. This is an area in which there's not a lot of. There, there's a, a, a kind of incomprehensibly little um, investment in research in. There's a lot of things that even direct air capture, um, pumping the carbon back under the ground, uh, that work in the laboratory, work in theory. They, there's not, there isn't, doesn't seem to be a real sort of technical challenge there to sort of make it work. It, the challenges are political, economic. How do you, and who pays for, who pays for this? Um, they're, they're, you know, cultural and conceptual sort of in, in other sort of, in sort of settings as well, but. There isn't a lot of it. Isn't sort of a big thing. You don't see, you know, sort of the same level of uh, of sort of newsworthy innovations in negative emissions technologies as you do for, say, you know, uh, cancer remedies, which are, you know, which we pour huge amounts of money in to to, for the most part, in many cases, to make people live a few years longer. Um, it's you could think of this. Here's another way of thinking about some of the the images I had up there of the the the. Um, performativity strategy of, of some of the XR sort of protests. If you were to compare the XR, that I mean, I'm not making it, my statement is not about XR. It's really sort of about the structure of, the, of, of this sort of, uh, the, the, the centralization of performativity in the, in the, as a sort of standalone practice. That's sort of the point. Compare this, for example, to ACT UP in the 80s, in the, sort of where many of the focus of the activism of ACT UP in the 80s around the AIDS crisis was a demand for fundamental research. That the, that the action that was demanded to be taken was fundamental research in immune therapy, uh, in, in, into, immune, into um, autoimmune sort of, sort of in, in autoimmune disorder therapies, among, among other, things, other things as well. The, that demand for the fundamental research and the, and, the, and the huge deployment of public and private monies for the expression and, and development and, and deployment of those fundamental research was not part of the plan that the groups that had organized the climate sort of strike had done, it rather, seems to me rather conspicuously. It's also not as much part of the, of, as much a part of both, of, of different forms of climate activism, I think, as it, as it probably should be. Why there isn't activism around the development of negative emissions technologies, I don't know. Given how much is at stake, and given how um, unnegotiable the removal of billions of, of, of tons actually is, it's not a supplemental or kind of in incidental part of the math. It's really fundamental to the to the whole to the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the um, like personal bodily effects that AIDS was having on individual victims has a really different um, relationship, like kind of causal relationship mm -hmm. to a group or an individual than a kind of mass planetary sure. carbon extraction. So maybe it's the medium is really much harder to kind of protest or find a form of protest or agency for. I, 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 no doubt. But what I just sort of mean it, I mean it in the sort of in the sense is like it, it, it's not as though there isn't precedent. For this, right? It's not as though that this is somehow outside of the art, of, outside of the vocabulary, um, or would be, or would be utter, sort of novel. This, this, this is this is a thing. So I wonder yeah, if that may be partly to do with the fact that, like, probably none of the XR protesters has watched their friends die. Like, I think that it might be it's still somehow. I'm sorry. Could you say none, that of, none of the XR protesters have been watching their friends die because of uh, climate change? Like, it's still something that's that, as Maybe. far as they're concerned, is something. Yeah, and again, I don't. I want. I know. say I'm not trying to pick on XR. Yeah. Sort of this is what. Well, that's quite not. Happy that's to. not sort of the point. Um, yeah, but you're right. There may be sort of a sense of like that there's <sighs> the visceral nature of this, but but, I, but I'm not sure why that that would necessarily even have to sort of lead to this. Sort of I mean, and, and, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I mean, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. The re potentially yeah. the real reason might yeah. be just the sheer disbelief. Because I think the difference, maybe with HIV and AIDS, was that it was this like, to some extent, it was this mystery. 
I, I don't think that people consider climate change to be a mystery. You know, I think that's the exact point, is that yeah. the consensus has been there when I was a little kid. Well, then, even, it, okay, you're no. right, but even, I, I totally agree, and I think this has everything, sort of the stuff that, that, that uh, Pierce was suggesting about the, the, um, the inability to identify culpability and to personify culpability. It's also the same thing to identify and individuate um, uh, the uh, victim or of this culpability or exactly. this, I mean, this, I think uh, the, the quotation of this as well. But I'm not sure, given that's the case, why would it be that if you have a situation where we don't know what's causing the autoimmune disorder, it's an individuated uh, process that is affecting people, the, the directly affecting in the person, you could you could imagine just as much that that would lead to a form of 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 of, of political demand that would be more performative uh, rather than one that is focusing on the massive allocation of institute uh, massive allocation at institutional level of funding for core research because it's so personified. I I, I, I think you're right. I just don't, it, it doesn't necessarily seem super clear to me why it would be one or the other, and it certainly doesn't seem to me as a reason why we could not have. There could not be a version of XR, something that is focused specifically on the demands for the 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 kinds of the, the kinds of actual direct means of actually directly affecting the problem, actually directly. Um, there's no reason. That, it doesn't seem that there's this, this anything that would disqualify that. I think this. I think this. Oh, so that, that just to make sure my point is, please. I think the simple reason would but, potentially be the kind of people who are involved, or the kind of people who don't want a technological solution, and that's that. I mean, I, 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 that would seem when you see the possible, you know, or also possibly that like it's it's an, uh, in in a sense it's a sort of irrational. It's it's an uh, irrational response to an irrational situation in some sort of way. Yeah. Like if when which I was, is forgivable. Exactly. That's yes. I think that's kind of what I mean. Sure. Um, and the, the options seem to be a bit like, especially in the UK, I mean, there's been this sense of complete post-democracy since the Blair years. Like, I don't know that, you know, perhaps Brexit is part of that whole system. Um, I think that there is a sense in the UK that, that trying to do things the proper way is a complete waste of everyone's time. So that you end up with these fringe kind of movements, like the sort of completely crazy kind of give me an elephant Brexit type people. But then also the sort of like give me uh, an elephant breakfast it's like like this yeah. like the sort of simpson like the sort of bart simpson kind of thing like yeah yeah, like, yeah i know i know i just want to make sure I, the reference is what i thought yeah. okay. um like some sort of basically like choosing an irrational option on purpose like and, and that so that kind of thing and also at the other end of the scale hmm. the sort of like yeah trying to interpretive dance your way out of climate change you know like because the stuff in the middle the people in the middle are just like well but what like, so, you know, I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to build the database of every single person who wants to fight climate change, you know? Mm -hmm. because, the, because ultimately that's XR's plan, right? Like, every single person should be eventually getting arrested because somehow that will... Because, because if you have enough symbols, it adds up to matter. I don't know. It's exactly. Like, but, the but accumulation of sim symbols will actually eventually have... Whereas the vast thing. majority of normal people are just like, well... Yeah, but what, like, it's not a, like I know. A, okay. a million people marched against the Iraq war, nothing happened. So mm -hmm. it makes sense, basically. I think that protest in the UK in, in and of itself is a completely irrational action that will have no function. Mm -hmm. And no wonder the people who are doing it are not demanding the right things. I think it's more about why aren't, you know, whatever the media mm -hmm. or politicians demanding the right things. And that's something that's a bit more... Yeah, no, I think we. Agree. I think I agree with your point. Um, I, I, and... Um, I mean, two sorts of things, and it's also quite clear that the regular, the, it's 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 not at all irrational to conclude that the that the conventional political institutions and media and means are fundamentally incapable of even defining the problem, let alone actually acting upon it uh, uh, effectively. That's not an irrational conclusion to. To, to draw by on this as well. And, but I also would, I mean, just as the, the, you, so I think we're in agreement. The, the a supplemental point to this whole thing is the phrase that you use of technological solution, this as well. I, I just want to be clear in terms of sort of the way in which I'm trying to position this notion of the geotechnical as precedent of the geo, geopolitical. There's ways in which I, what I sort of see is the kind of political reductionist discourse will, will use the term of a solutionism as a way to 
kind of qualify the possibility of the sort of techno in, in interventions with the presumption that the idea is that, and, and they're not wrong in, in many cases, that, that the invocation of a technical intervention would, uh, would allow for, in essence, the uh, a, a no a, no transformation within a political economic or cultural system that in fact is is meant to be a, is, is proposed as a substitution for a transformation in the political economic and cultural condition and I I, I, uh, uh, I quite actually quite agree with that with this with that with the sentiment as, as, as far as, as as sort of far as it goes the argument that we're sort of making just to sort of be clear is not the this this en enrollment of the geotechnological um, uh, sort of apparatus, the geotechnology that looks like a geopolitics, so that the political and economic solution can be left un untransformed. But that, with the presumption that should it be developed, there is absolutely no way that the political and economic system could not be fundamentally transformed. It just the machine can't operate according according to the uh, with in with according to the system that we. That we actually have now. So, just to be clear, that I think I wanted to make this distinction between the way in which we're thinking, talking about the geotechnology from the what is sometimes identified as solutionism, the critique of which I share. Yeah. Um, we spoke a bit about planning and yeah. uh, these sort of nation-sized organizations, usually corporate entities, Amazon, Huawei, etc. We should probably put oil companies in there too. Oh, definitely. No, because they're the ones who are there. Look, in terms of what I mentioned, that I don't mean to be really here, but the 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 negative emission technologies, the for example, the burying of massive amounts of carbon. In order to do that, you have to have some kind of massive infrastructural entity that is capable of capturing, doing direct air capture, doing um, huge and huge infrastructural scale transformation and filtering of the carbon is transferred sort of after this well it, with what will look a lot like uh, uh, with, with you know huge sort of chemical plant structure some means to actually move this around the geological engineering expertise to build the to build mechanisms that are the inverse of the points of extraction by which carbon has previously been liberated from the ground. Basically, what you need are oil companies operating in reverse that are sucking things in, moving it the other direction, putting it back in the ground. So you can either invent those, you can, or you can use the ones we have, but, but put them in reverse somehow. So all we're saying is that we should, we've got to add oil companies to the list. They're on the list. Good. <laughs> um, and I was kind of going in a similar direction. I mean, I, the word that is often attached to planning is centralized planning. And within corporations, we are, um, you know, there's this uh, Chomsky term, islands of tyranny. They're basically, they're doing planning and because they have pure uh, kind of persuasive, you know, um, organizational structure. And so what you mentioned earlier was like a failure of architectural imagination to take planning beyond a central, an overly centralized structure. And I kind of wondered what needs to be, what kind of conditions and realities need to be naturalized outside of these tyrannous, insular, black boxed structures in order for us to get to work with those architectures. I mean, things like, wastefulness to kind of echo the Fisher point from earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so much of what corporations expend their energy on, I, I would guess something like 75% is creating the illusion that they are efficient. You know, they are unwilling to accept. So the reason why the kind of state models fell away in some sense is that we were able to point to the moments of waste and then, you know, they were argued that they should be kind of clipped away. Um, but also, when we take this to an ecological level, sort of waste and kind of death is part of, like I love this metaphor of folding because what that does is it, it, it brings a, a whole, it brings geological time into an action, into a verb. Um, mm -hmm. And so much of what that is, is, is like loss and, and, and death and kind of um, everything that churns up in order to, to make the next procedural leap. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my, to put this into a question, 
um, is sort of can can planning be decentralized and what kinds of uh, of kind of affordances and conditions do we have to accept uh, in order for that to um, to take to take flight? Okay. Um, so, would you say that the do you, so it, it, the implication, if I if I'm hearing you properly, correct me if this is wrong. The implication part of it is that part of the pathologies of the modern corporation is a technical and institutional form are due to its centralized mechanism of planning and authority and that the pathologies that you've listed and identified could be remedied by a decentralization of planning is that the hypothesis because I'm not so I'm not, not necessarily well, also what I meant was that I think there's a, what I would simply just say is like I, the top down versus bottom up is for sure way too simplistic that's what I sort of mean, and, and that, that, that if we're at the point where we're arguing about should it be top down or bottom up, or that there are some people who are sort of like there's a decentralization, patriotism, and you know, and centralization, evangelism, we're having the wrong conversation. No, it's yeah, more about yeah. piercing the membrane between this structure and the world beyond it, and you know, it's not sim like a simple question of yeah, top down, bottom up, centralized, decentralized. What goes on within a corporation is is pretty centralized. It can be. It does not necessarily. It means some things that they operate in like extremely. No, no. Not, I mean, sometimes and sometimes not. It really kind of depends on the on the on the corporate architecture. And, and some aspects of it are operating in a centralized way. Some aspects are not in a centralized mm. way. Certain ways in which procedures and protocols and mechanisms and logistical functions are built into an internal corporate system. That allow that are themselves centrally planned, so that massively decentralized functions can take place, mm. and so that you can point at the thing and try to decide if this is centralized or decentralized, and it's both mm -hmm. at the same time. So it's, again, I'm not sure sure with this as well. But I, again, I, it, your question though is how do we? If so, what is a way in which what are the what are the organizational forms that could operate at the same level of scale that or don't exhibit the same pathologies as the corporate as the, as the corporate structures do? Even if we're talking about those corporate structures themselves as the thing that takes the takes their place. I think the model is very useful. It's a question of how to do planning beyond those those structures. Is the problem is the problem is that okay? I'm not sure that the problem of their planning is because it's centralized. I think it's because they're, in many cases, are incentivized around extremely perverse uh, produce mechanisms of economics. There's no reason, Mark and I were having this conversation, there's absolutely no reason search engines should be predicated on advertising. There's no, there's nothing, this is, this is in itself a kind of first principle pathology around this sort of to work. And so once this, be, and that was part of the case, is because, um, uh, you know, there wasn't a, there wasn't a public option. Why wasn't there a public option? Why were there other sort of that relationship between these kinds of platforms and even the, what we would identify as being public or private? I think this distinction itself is a diff, is a another. There's a, a, it has a similar fragility to the nature culture divide that we would probably kind of structure in terms of this, this as well. So there's lots of. In other words, I just want to sort of like. Yes, that there's multiple pathologies to this corporate structure. Yes, there's massive amounts of waste to this corporate structure. Yes, there's all sorts of weird ways in which different kind of dynamics of centralization of, of, of planning and this as well. Um, I'm not so sure that it's always that one is the cause of the other in this kind in, in, in this kind of in this. To clarify, I'm not but actually please. dissing the waste. Like I think the waste is natural. I don't think oh. anything useful was well was produced without an intense deal of waste. I just think that, I guess it, the Fisher point is because it's, it's a capitalist realist kind of uh, construction whereby we're pretending that there isn't waste. And that is the kind of... Because invisibility and uncomfortability. Exactly, sort of the waste, because right? they're concealed and black boxed and so on. Yeah. Uh, we were... I don't remember. I was speaking to someone... Or, or, I, I know, we were speaking to someone at the party about this, um, actually. about how one of the axioms of the post-68, post-structuralist theoretical catechism was Bataille's general economy. The idea that the, real path that the pathology of the capitalist economy is that it is a restricted economy. 
drawing on Weber and this thesis of the Protestant, Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. That, that, that unlike the natural primitive economies in which there is a potluck and expenditure and, and so forth and so on in this natural circulation, that the capitalist economy is uniquely pathological in that all of the excess profit that it produces, its surplus, is is sort of uh, is reinvested, is is re-eaten back into itself, and that and that this ends up allowing it for this sort of sort of to kind of growth, but it 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 is a um, it ends up producing these other kinds of pathology, the other sorts of pathology. So what is needed is a, is an economy that's predicated on the unlimited expenditure of waste, the unlimited expenditure of of uh, useless symbolization for its own for its own sake. Um, again, this is sort of a you know a kind of predicate of the of the of, of the sort of, the, of some of the post structuralist um, suspicion of rationalization of, of of mechanisms. But quite clearly, in many ways, it's quite it's where our situation is really in many ways kind of the inverse of this. That we have an economy, the capitalist economy, if anything, is a massive machine for the pointless expenditure of heat and waste so for its own sake. Uh, that's kind of what it is. It would be nice to have a restricted economy. It would be really nice to figure out a way in which you could actually recapture and reinvest some of this stuff in some way or another. Um, this, the, the, this, closed, this sort of closed mechanism that he sort of identifies doesn't seem to really even exist anymore. Um, Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I please. Had a, I had a question, um, more so for maybe a bit of clarification. Um, at the end, you talked about this idea that we might need a um, tech apparatus to come before the political shifts or the will of the people. Like you kind of described this idea of, yeah. um, you know, instead of waiting for the will of the people to then turn into laws, to then turn into. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through more detail tomorrow on this, okay. what I mean by this, but yeah. Yeah, because, um, well, that makes sense to some degree to me. It makes me wonder, like, what our role of design is within that. Um, because if we start at the point of a tech apparatus that is capable of enabling these political shifts before the will of the people, um, who do we expect to suggest those tech apparatuses, or actually more so than suggest them, implement them, that will actually align with what's best for the people. Uh, this is exactly my point about we're waiting for, we have the means, we're waiting for the sovereigns who can actually enforce this means. So I mean, just terms of the role of design is like you should be making the, what, you, what, you, think, what we, you think is that the geotechnology that we need, uh, it's, it's, not gonna make its, it's not gonna make itself. But you're, you're exactly right. This is a question of what's the, who's the client? If I kind of, if I kind of got the, the gist of this as well. Um, we, in a certain sense, we have a lot of the, we understand what a lot of the means would be. We have sort of things that would work. Uh, what we don't have is the, is the, as an economic, political, and cultural uh, means to actually enroll them and enforce them. So I think we're asking a very similar question. Yeah, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. That's that, but you're right, that's the question. Right, okay, yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. meant, yeah. And what it sort of meant is, is also, just, it's not just that there's a geotechnology would be pres precedent of the geopolitics, but also that the geopolitics that we need would look like a geotechnology from today's perspective, and perhaps the other way around, that the geotechnology we need would look like a geopolitics from this perspective, and, and this as well. And so if that means to, I don't mean that to equivocate the point more, uh, but rather that um, what, it may not look what, like what we think it looks like. Uh, just about the uh, yep. kind of little existential crisis Please. just to the end Always. of the day. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, no, I was thinking about the, the task. Do you, is you want to stand up? The stand up? No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, like it's the, the task is kind of twofold because for, uh, on one yep. way you have to act or to operate um, over subjectivities uh, in ways uh, comprehensible to them and to their sensors, like for example, humans, most of them have eyes and they actually function. So uh, media deals with that. But in another way, the tendency is um, 
that planetary computation uh, runs even more uh, quickly and more uh, ubiquitous, de facto, like it, it actually does. Um, not necessarily because we, oh yeah, because we actually feed it. Um, so we actually have a technology that deals with um, governance. It's capable. It's capable, exactly. It's capable. It's there. So which also... Is, some of which I'll, we'll, I'll be trying to extend this exact point tomorrow. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with you so far. The Nowadays, and maybe the tendency is that, the communication happens between the machines and machines. So sure. I was I was wondering if uh, the other task, like uh, operating over humans, the other task is to operate over the protocols or the languages, which are not necessarily uh, comprehensible to humans, uh, which operates within the machines. So in a way, uh, the task is to mediate and to uh, build different kinds of technologies to those kind of subjects. So to reach an eventual uh, uh, shift in, uh, in the kind of governance we have right now. Well, we do, to an, in a sense. I mean, we do the, the, a lot of the work that goes into the continuous design and redesign and ongoing replacement of the components of those planetary scale computational apparatus are, are, are ones that, are, that allow for specific communication between other components within the system, but that not, not all of them are structures at, at once. And they're not generally, generally legible, not just as most software is not generally legible. So I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not sure what, this may be, an, this may be a point where the, the premise of the subject the premise of subjectivity as the thing that needs to be made begins to break down a little bit. Or it begins, to, or not break down, but begins to find its limit. Yeah. Where, where, and this is maybe a certain point, and, and again, Mark and I, um, we talked a little bit about this, is, is that the, um, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that it's, that, that it's the, that the thing that needs to appear is something that we, is something that we would recognize from today as a, collective subject in the same way that we understand a, a nation as a collective subject or a corporation as a collective subject. An agency of some sort. Capacity, a capacity position for enforcement, yes. Whether or not this is a subject in all of the ways that it has a kind of self-transparency, um, that it articulates and communicates itself through self-identification in all of those kinds of ways, I'm not sure. Maybe, but I think there's other ways as well. Um, hi. hi. Uh, I was curious because at some point you mentioned that it was like very important to declare like the state of emergence or the, or the state of exception in order to start, I think, in, in my opinion, to start this plan, this viable plan. Mm. So, but... Not exactly, but... I'll no, like, okay, I understood that emergency is important in order that this kind of sovereign uh, mechanism to appear that is the one that is able to deploy the geotechnical, geo geopolitical, geoeconomical um, changes that in some way we need. And I wonder if in the same way that uh, the stack or this accidental megastructure is responsible uh, that we already know what is or, or, or the concept itself of climate change. So in some way for me, the stack is actually that first sign of emergency. I wonder if is this evolved or it could be this evolved version of the stack, this evolved version of um, planetary scale computation system, which is no more accidental, but is actually full of uh, agency. Or deliberateness. Yeah. Rather, the, rather than accidental. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The one that is actually able to deploy not only the geotechnical changes that we really need, uh, but also is that uh, geotechnical system itself the one that is able to deploy also the geoeconomical ones and also the geopolitical ones? I mean, there's not like they, that yeah. infrastructure deploys that, the geotechnological changes that um, 
obligates other system to change the way in which they oper operate uh, politically and economically, but actually that system is itself the geo uh, geoeconomical chain. And if that is the case, mm -hmm. what will be the role of this uh, pseudo nation entities we call internet platforms? That at some point I think they are like so involved in what we call the stack and they are so involved in what we call this, uh, auto uh, not automated, but uh, computational, at planetary scale computation system which, what do you think will be the role of those entities, those platforms in the future? Uh, so first of all, the idea of the shift from the accidental megastructure to the sort of delivery mm -hmm. structures, I think I quite agree. I think it's quite, I think it's part of this, this premise of the proposition of the stack to come, that the part of the, 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 the stack, we have to not forget that the stack, the stack systems that as a network architecture were the reason the structure was because not only that it allows for the modular replacement of each of the loan replacements, in fact, in a certain sense, demands this. And so that it, it inevitably, like Theseus' ship, it will be replaced in sort of one, one, one way or another. But that, the deliberateness of it and the lack of the accidentality, I, I, I quite, I quite agree. I also sort of quite agree that in many sense, we should look at, at, at systems like that not so much as only as the technology through which or with which some kind of political or economic operation would instantiate its policy, which is, I'll talk a little bit about why I think that economists and political scientists and lawyers really can't wrap their head around this, the, the, this exact sort of phenomenon. Um, uh, but that it would, but that it would, uh, but that it would do so in the sort of way that it would actually be the, the mechanism of this enactment itself in ways or sense. Now, to the question of those platforms, um, uh, different things in different ways because they do different they do different kinds of things and the things that they do in relationship to the scenario and the model that you described are not necessarily the things that we think about that they look like what they do um, the ways in which a search engine functions as a kind of semantic sensory apparatus um, by which it is capturing modeling and ordering massive amounts of little semantic snippets to try to produce, that in, in that produces uh, models of the correspondence by which this, uh, uh, what, what is clearly a, an artificial linguistics um, in, in, in emergence. Amazon obviously is a sort of logistical structure platform, but Amazon also in many ways at the end of the day is a price signal. That's really what it does. Yeah, it, move, it will coordinate buyers and sellers in, in sort of warehouse boxes from here to there. But mostly what it does is it figures out how much that used book should be, should be worth. It's kind of has solved Hayek's Cadillac's problem. It produces a gener generic price signal. So whatever the things that do, one of the things that this system will need to do is produce price signals. Amazon is one of the things that, that begins to do this. It's not necessarily the only one. It's not the best one. It's optimized towards a whole, all other kinds of things that we might identify as easily identify as wasteful or, or pathological. But that is one of the things that, that, it, that it, it sort of does. So I think you would, would want to sort of look through these into themselves and try to kind of understand like not what does it look like what it does, how, not how to describe itself, but in a sense like what is its what is what is it what is it doing and what is its is a kind of irreducible function and kind of in relationship with this as well. So with the GAFA stacks up to me, Google and Amazon are much more interesting. We'll probably have much more um, broad usefulness in this regard than the than the other than the other two. But that's that's a, it's a kind of structure. Also clearly I, I don't think that there's I mean one of the things that you're at least in the short term the argument that I made in the book was not just that these platforms are taking on roles and functions of the state and that all national and that nation states are liquefying into this vaporous cloud thing, but absolutely just as much the other way around, that states are evolving into platforms. Uh, and that states evolve in relationship, always have evolved historically in relationship to what they can see, what they can model, what they can surveil with these apparatus, and the cloud allows for them to see and sense the world in different ways. And so this kind of hemispherical reconsolidation of the of, of, of what I call hemispherical stacks between sort of enclosures of a 
of a of a, of the the delinking of the the GAFA stack and the BAT stack, the U.S. models and the Chinese models, the EU sort of closing in on itself with its own kind of piles of legal gestures, um, organizing around this conception of a of it of its citizenship. That there that 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 you're beginning to see this kind of continental consolidation of not a, not the stack, but lots of stacks. Um, the, stack is a the stack is a kind of generic institutional technical model that is rapidly speciating um, into different versions of itself that are sometimes have not only antagonistic, but sometimes explicitly militarized relationships with one another. Perceive it more like, um, I mean, I, I wonder, it's possible that this network, network of different stacks that are evolved, and yet they are not more accidental, but they are full of um, deliberateness. Yeah. I mean, how you can take that out from the way in which we perceive today, uh, uh, the way in which we govern our countries, like we are, in some way, we are uh, constrained by limitations, like very physical and very uh, individually, in, in, like individual constraints. At some point, like even if there are collective, are like form in form of clusters. They, we are not thinking in a global way, even if we keep going with this kind of system, a network system. To me, it seems more like obvious, like an entity like Google, for example. It could be able to, at some point, uh, are like deliver some kind of global uh, deliberateness. I mean, for example, I think Google in some way is part of, uh, like a very important part of our culture today, but it's actually actually responsible to uh, overview effect that is happening in some way, in my opinion, at, at a, global uh, um, a global scale. Like Google Earth or Google Maps have made us aware in some way of this kind of overview effect over the Earth as a whole system. So, I don't know, I, I think maybe like a, an evolution uh, or evolved version of Google, yeah. like it's not like photograph taken like two years ago, but actually I can check out Google Earth and I can go right now to, I don't know, like a concert that's happening like on live somewhere else and I can actually be there in Google Earth and imagine this like a uh, speculative way, like a Google Earth that is actually live, you know, like it's not like, uh, images taken from two years ago, but actually it's live in a global scale. So how cold, I mean, it's, to me it's, it seems like this it has, it's much more feasible that these kind of entities absorb um, like what we call today nations, that actually nations become platform itself that can actually deal with the platform that we already have. I don't know if I explain myself very well. <laughs> Well, I think what you're seeing, I mean, I, I think what you're seeing is a de-differentiation of the state, of, of the roles of these platforms in the relationship to their host states. I mean, the Chinese model is one in which they're much more closely interwoven than you might see in, you might see in, in the US, but the ways in which the large Chinese platforms are understood as part and parcel of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a more integrated societal initiative that's in note that is meant to be um, far less accidental um, and it's, 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 it's something that's sort of o o already present present with us. Um, if I if I get a little sense of what you're talking about, the idea of like is is there not a a kind of alternative universe version of Google that would be able to do many of the things that we're talking about if it wasn't predicated on advertising as its prime as the primary motivating uh, dis distorting factor in, in, in of its op op operations. Yeah, but to me, it seems it, like it, it depends on how expansive you want to mean what you were willing to mean in terms of like version of Google. Uh, there's ways, obviously, ways. I think very clearly ways in which these platforms have informally absorbed many of the core traditional core functions of modern of modern nation states. And there's no reason that they couldn't do. There's no technical reason why they couldn't do do more do more of those. It's highly unlikely that they would do more of those, to the extent that their primary, that their economics is primarily organized around around advertising, because there's no way in which that that those kinds of initiatives that may be socially beneficial, any kinds of things, can be rationalized as 
advertising projects in the long run this as well. So you have to, there has to be a different way. Find a different, something else for it to breathe. Because right now it's breathing, it's, it's sort of stuck in this way, right? So the advertise, the, this, this, this capitalization of, this financialization and capitalization of attention was both the thing that made the Google we have possible, it's also the thing that's preventing it from actually fulfilling its Hegelian destiny. <laughs> to organize all of the world's information and to make all of it useful to all things at all times. Yeah. But then wouldn't the geoeconomics need to come before the geotechnical? Uh, uh, it, it could. I, I'm not, I'm not, a, no, I'm not, listen, I, I'm not, I don't exclu I don't mean to, I don't mean to preclude any option in this regard. I simply wanted to emphasize and to make particularly clear that we need to hold open the very real possibility that the geotechnical would precede the geoeconomic and the geopolitical. I'm not trying to foreclose the paths by which the an, a transformation economic what, transformation what we call economics, ontologies of value, what counts as valuable, who decides, how is this circulated, uh, and so forth and so on would, would would not be the thing that sort of brings about these. It's, it's quite plausible, depending on what we mean by economics in this regard. I mean, maybe jumping yeah. off of that, uh, yeah. just as a provocative uh, inquiry, um, amongst the different like sort of terms that were set for the program of like anti-mythology, anti-anti-Leviathan, um, is there a specific reason why anti-capitalism isn't in that list? Is it? I mean, I can guess why. Like, I can see what, that maybe. Go ahead, guess. A possible. Well, I can no, see no, that no, a possible no, no. solution. <laughs> A possible oh, solution to oh. actually save or create a viable planetary might fall within capitalism, um, and that perhaps that is something that needs to be deprioritized for our main goal, which is a viable planetary. But I was just curious in jumping. No, I, I think it just has to do with. I, it, it doesn't mean that the, the ways in which that the pathologies of a contemporary economic order are something that sh you know cannot and cannot be dealt with directly or sort of pointed at in sort of what, what, one way or another. I'm not. I think the ways in which the the term itself co co has sort of come to constitute a kind of uh, it's become um, extraordinarily imprecise into what is actually kind of referring to in, in in a way or another. So I'm not sure exactly what even to say that you were pro or anti-capitalism ultimately would ultimately would re would would refer to uh, in, in this sort of regard. But also, and I think in a more fundamental sense, um, like Mr. F like Mr. Fisher. I think you want to hold on to the notion that cap that that the sort of the, that fundamental. I agree with the fundamental Marxist axiom that about capitalism being this extraordinarily dynamic, productive and destructive uh, apparatus. It is both the thing that makes these wonders possible and the thing that prevents them from reaching their fruition. That that's that's a line from from Marx. That that this whole, this whole, this whole thing worked. So I think it's that, it, to a certain extent, it's, it's the both and and the ambivalence in relationship to those, those kinds of processes that we want to continue to be, continue to be attentive to. However, the more, the really sort of the reason of this as well is that, is that in the sense of the geoeconomics to come and the rationale of this as, is of this as well, I, my sense is that um, were that to take place, were there to be a geoeconomics to come that would sort of organize and sort of this as well, it very likely would be one that is mostly illegible to 20th century Cold War notions of public and private, socialist, capitalist sort of models of this as well. There may be ways in which it could be recognized as something that is a kind of very weird capitalism, or as Ken Work says, it's not capitalism, it's something worse. Um, or it could be something that we might rec you, if you want to recognize it as a form of socialism, it you, it could work. If you want to recognize there's something, it could sort of work. But mostly, it would be something that probably is not uh, is not well described by those um, the mid those three the, the sort of that that basic uh, repertoire of options that the left right dynamic where people sat during the French Revolution may not be the only cartography <laughs> and spectrum that we can use in order to think about how it is that ontologies of value become institutionalized in, in, one, in one, one, way, uh, one, one way or another. 
So it's, the reason it's not on there is not because um, we think capitalism as we understand it is the way to go, but rather that the thing that would sort of come out of it would be something that just, that, 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 that the glossary itself might not be nearly as, as helpful as we, we think that it does. And that the longer the time that we spend in those closed loops of trying to sort of make these words do something that they may not be as good at doing anymore, um, maybe it's time where it would be better spent um, doing something that does work, I guess, this way. Is that what you thought? Is that the answer? Yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Hi. maybe instead of being anti-capitalist, we should be anti-capitalist realism. So from my understanding of Fisher is You can be anti-capitalist if you want, if, as long as you're specific of what we, you mean by that. Exactly. Like, this, like adding the realism to the definition of yeah. capitalism, I think it, it helps in this case. Sure. Because, because it puts us in a perspective of admitting what are our limits in our socioeconomical system and maybe overcome them and look for something different. Yes, this, this, I, this that right, there is no alternative that of the sort of the realism. Is there al there's always an alternative. Uh, there's always this. this sort of so, so that is, yes, for sure. But yeah, at yeah, the yeah. moment, it seems like, like connected to what he was saying, like uh -huh. there is this... Uh, uh, reflexive impotence uh, in, in, in society where the, the only thing that we come up with is uh, this kind of uh, manifestation of extension, extension rebellion, rebellion or, or politics or whatever which are which have a lot of limits. there's yes they're uh, they're understandable but they are I would agree they're sort of they're systematic of, of something that is not some, of something that's not working right a sense of impotence and attraction and sort of this as well, yeah. So if you see them as also part of the, as, as part of the, the, the um, something that we would ex should expect to see under the, under the, in the milieu and malaise of capitalist realism, uh, I wouldn't disagree with that as well. And so... I think it, we should go over. Yes. Like we should get, overcome this, 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 these things, but we have to name them first. So maybe. you mentioned Mackenzie Ward. Maybe, maybe I, we have to name them first. Sometimes something. there's lots of things we make before we have names for them. This is the other part of the, I mean, we, there's lots of things we, we make names for before they exist. Special speculative design is particularly good at this, but there's lots of things that we, exist, that we make that we don't, it took, takes us a while to figure out what they, that we actually need a name for it later. So maybe, maybe we need a name for it. But simply just sort of to say is that, is that, is I, is that what is that, um, uh, what, whatever po is post-capitalism uh, may also be post-socialism, may also be post-libertarianism, may also be post-communism. It may just be something that, again, just as we wouldn't expect to have a, 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 an 18th century uh, medical textbook be able to properly categorize everything that we would be able to find with a uh, uh, modern medical imaging equipment. It would be a weird translation. There's no reason to assume that mid 20th century Cold War economic models are the ones are eternal. It's not surprising that g given the sense that some of the critical discourses we're building off of are in themselves have a deep European lineage were in, in different ways also trying to overcome and escape. It's not surprising to a certain extent that Europe would think that everyone else's future looks like its past. That every time that there's right wing populism, it's basically a recapitulation of 1939. That Europe is the model, it's a standard, it's the same story, everybody's following the same sort of script. And I think part of the provincialization of the European tradition is also to presume that uh, Europe's past is not our, the models by which Europe understands its economic past is in terms of these cold war numbers is not necessarily everyone's future either. So then just to clarify, would this Yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it works. Because it works better. I mean, I think there's, I think there's us, as I was saying, I think there needs to be sort of a presumption in a certain system that, that the, the more, uh, that the viability of that viable planetarity, that, that, what, that, that uh, is one that we are making this, we're making the hypothesis and presumption, that not only is it more fair, but it, 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 that it actually, it works better. 
that way. Uh, That's kind of already a clue towards the, like, is repositioning or, uh, I mean, understanding of capitalism and socialism, but like proletarianism is very much more on one side than on the other. Yeah, but it, it, it's it's still it's it's a, still a, it, it's um, I, I mean it in a sense of it's sort of a deliberately ambiguous term, and you can take of it in terms of uh, uh, egalitarianism, in terms of a, a di re distribution of resources, distribution of action, and this as well. And it also doesn't necessarily only refer to people um, in this in, in this in this sense. But I think, but it certainly it it, it certainly would. I, I think that the part it it seems quite clear to me. I don't think it's a difficult argument to really to make that. Part of the reason that the the struggles that we have to actually allow for the struggles we have to give way to the kind of um, the position of sovereign decision that would be necessary for the deployment and for, and even in some cases your the, your Hegel Google the fulfillment of these other sort of things is as well is because there is a a kind of uh, extraordinary consolidation of wealth decision and resources. Uh, in ways that distort the ability of the entire system to act back upon itself. It's not an argument against centralization. Yeah. 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 Just a remark about so we talked about geopolitics, geotechnology, and geoeconomics. I wonder where the whether we should also talk about geolegal because. Um, as things stand right now, the only thing that we can relate to other subject is mostly through um, ideas of personhood. So you give right. personhood to companies or to the river yeah. or whatever, and that's you know obviously probably not useful. So that that's uh, that's our form of animism. Yes, that, that that's is our animism. that's our form of animism. It's like that corporation is a person. The tree is a person. And it is very attractive person. because yes. that's, we an are human. that's an anthropomorphic narrativization. Yeah, yes. because we are human, so that's the only way that we can kind of have solidarity with other things. But yeah. you know, how do we, how do you hold something accountable without giving it personhood? So maybe we should also renegotiate what personhood means for humans as well, in a way that you know, how do you hold humans accountable, and how do you hold hold other things accountable without? Necessarily anthropomorphizing them. Yes, and it's also I, I think that it, it's a little bit is the way I see it. Part of the shift in the sort of the biopolitical attention of that geopolitical regime is looking at one that is shifting away from an observation of the thoughts, wills, and desires of the persons towards one that's based on the direct coordination observation of studies of this, the biology and the geochemistry itself. Um, would be probably one in which the accountability of individual persons is less of a central concern, where those relations of negative and po positive and negative liberty is not quite so central, and that the expansion of personhood wouldn't really make sense because persons are not the center of the legal system in the first place. Uh, th those processes sort of are themselves, and so it may again, it may be a question which like we're we're asking the question in a way that's also not allowing us to get out of the loop of the question. Like, how is it that we could have, what is the model for personhood that would allow for the same kind of forms of, of individuated accountability that personhood allows for that's not personhood? It may be one that's not personhood and therefore is not about this individuated questions of these sorts of forms of, of, of accountability in the same, in, in the same way. Um, but you're absolutely. I, I totally agree that this this question sort of around this sort of as well. There's some discussion. I'll sort of I'll, I'll go into a little bit tomorrow, um, a little bit more in in our discussion in uh, this this avatar theory of political representation. But also some of the ways in which the the, the what I see as the trying to link this problem of of the over individuation of planetary scale computation. Um, to exactly the problem of what wh what we identify as this as the base unit of of what that um, what that 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 that, uh, that alternative geobiopolitical regime would be would be interested in not not individuals that's the, yeah, that's that's, that's the spoiler yeah it could go two ways like 
I think that maybe for being stuck, you've tried to outline, you know, in the users layer, the kind of different, yeah. you know, subjects that could exist. So sure, but the user, I mean, technology, but also through some kind of law enforcement that is more deliberate. Right. And more but the user layer, I mean, the users, can, I mean, a user can be animal, vegetable, mineral, it can be plural, singular, anything that can sort of be, have, or know, and could be credentialized by any of those properties can tend to be a user. I mean, we step into or out of plural user positions constantly and all the time in relationship this to this as well. And so I get to me, I, I think you're right. This is one of the things I think is there's a potential for uh, potential for further development of the, of this position is that we already have in a way developed a global infrastructure for which the core position, the core position of agency to in relation to that infrastructure, which is the user, that anything that can manipulate the interface or be manipulated by this interface is sort of counter the way. We've already made this position. It's there. Uh, and we, in a certain sense, there's already been a, a weird kind of accidental advocation of the of the sort of the single serving subject in relationship with the system that we already have. Uh, how do we make how do you then take how do we then take the next step and make good on that? Uh, and sort of and organize a different kind of form of uh, uh, of regularization of enforcement. I, I guess I want to use a term that's a little more general than legal, because it may not involve uh, people writing things down on pieces of paper that have this prefigurative description of, of things that can and cannot happen. It may be there may be something else at work. It, it could be that also, but it, I don't think we necessarily want to assume that that's the only option but some sort of mean of preemptive enforcement, right? Of all the things that can happen, um, these ones will not, right? This, fund, this is, I guess, the sort of your question back to the, well, isn't the Hegel Google, can't this sort of do this thing? One of the, th I mean, also one of the sort of the core foundations of the, the specificity of the state in any context is its monopoly on legitimate violence. That at the end of the day, the legal authority to, um, for uh, of the the legal authority and the sort of last instance of violence is is claimed by is claimed by the state, not the clan or the warlord or the good guy with a gun, or whatever. But ultimately, unless it's just sort of the structure of the state. Now, you could the in this sense, it's, the sort of violence is just kind of a specific version. It's like in the last instance, the last instance of the deployment of force and enforcement. That this is the thing that is going to happen. The other exclusions of this is that will be directly prevented um, from happening. This sort of much of this as well. That like what would possess this last instance sovereignty of force is it a state? Is it law? Is no, it's like the edgy phrase of command. The what? That's like the edgy, just the edgy praise of command. Economies. Edgy praise. What's that? Bus is edgy. edgy praise. It's a little edgy. The edgy parts of command economies, yeah. Well, because there's a because in you know in in, in many in many centralized command economies that the the, the the monopoly on legitimate force is, is not is not so not so ambiguous, um, but they also have their own there's they also have their own problems that were sort of well understood of sort of information information flow pathologies the inability to respond to transformation that they sort of end up sort of reinforcing their own. Bureaucratic ineptitudes. All, all, I mean, there's this. It's it, yes, but I'm not suggesting that that's the solution. But if you think so, that's fine. But some form of a, but something. What we are talking about in some sort of way is a kind of command economy. The question is, what do we mean by command? And what do we mean by economy? But yes, yeah. And where the point of force is, and where the decision is issues from. At which point of the decision the where the decision where the where the decision yes. where the decision originates from where the decision is mediated yeah. where the decision can be when and how the decision can be altered and innovated upon and what's enforcing the point of all what what is enforcing all of the above right which may be people maybe maybe animal vegetable mineral around this as well it may work in different sorts of ways but yes right How's that for our first day?
Put in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting there. I'm sure we'll, um, lots to go through. Um, I was thinking about the, the apropos of nothing. I was thinking about this this sort of replacement of the the you know the ways in which that within the sort of same relay chain you can have the the, the same relation, but the human might be replaced or displaced by the machine, or the human might replace the machine, or without actually that position sort of changing sort of around this as much. And around the sort of relay thing. Again, this is really apropos of nothing, but sort of this just as a sort of last thought. Um, so in the US and probably here as well, you should have known that a lot of the fast food restaurants are serving this uh, meatless meat. Right? So you have, in essence, plants that are replacing meat. Um, we also have these um, cell tower mechanisms that look like trees, but they're actually cell towers. So here you have machines that look like plants. Um, we also have the examples of forgetting, but you also have the, 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 the animals that are replacing sort of the plants. So in a certain sense that you have this, the whole, the entirety of contemporary technical innovation is just about meat, plants, and machines trading places with one another. Furries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you, Pierce wins. <laughs> Pierce wins the internet today. Yeah. Yes, Pierce, plants, machines, and meat. Just sh switching places with one another. So if you can think about more ways for plants, machines, and meat to replace one another, you can get a lot of funding. Any other last thoughts we want to sort of, I think? Uh, yeah, please. Like, uh, with, all these, uh, with all these transformations replacing um, cell towers with trees and stuff like this, all yeah. we are creating is like a bigger bubble. A what? A bigger bubble for ourselves. Um, yes. And again, like as is the thing with all bubbles, they are meant to burst at some yep. point of time. Yeah. And again, like since we are talking about terraforming, mm -hmm. uh, where do the humans go? Because like we are talking about everything, but like at the end of it, humans are like fickle-minded creatures. We have been here only for like four seconds or something like mm. the global timeline, and we have done so much. Where do you think they should go? Exactly. So it's like... Uh, no, it wasn't a rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> and on top of that, uh, with all these big, um, like the stack, like uh, Google, Facebook, everything, with uh, things like Cambridge Analytica uh, and mass media manipulation via technology. Yeah, but this, this, is, this is a result of, this, of, the, of this, the deployment of planetary scale computation Exactly. For the production and yeah. maintenance of yeah. individuated profiles. Yes. Yeah. The so whole system is there to try to predict what the monkey is going to click on next. Yeah. That's how you get Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, but like, uh, what, like, after terraforming? With like, so stuff. currently we will probably make a prediction, like, probably this might happen or something we're not like going that. We're not going anywhere. And uh, that, that is the like we'll question. have we, a plan, we, like we'll what? Stay. We're, we'll be yeah, here. exactly. So yeah. we'll uh, think like this is probably something that might happen, and we'll have a plan to do something about this. But like, um, just in case, like it might not work out, or something new I'm emerges. Sure. I, I'm, like, sure, um, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. Actually, that it won't work out. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just as a starting point. Yeah. What do we do then? Uh, exactly. That's my question. What do we do with them? <laughs> It, it, it'll be it'll be Mad Max and Gattaca at the same time, <laughs> both at the same time, one inside the other, in alternating layers like a Christmas cake. It's not good. There is no, the plan never works out. That's not the point. Yeah. Uh, it's it's it, it has to constantly change and replace itself as sort of it goes along. But really, so the question: Where do the humans go? I, like, if if it seemed like part of the story that we're suggesting would be one in which we're talking about everything except the humans and where did sort of to go, that, that shouldn't be the way in which we're starting this off. That, that, that this question of this this Copernican trauma and this descending the interest is not just to it's not to erase or remove the humans from the story. Quite the opposite. It's actually to specify like what what humans exactly. are and what uh, they do. And I it, agree with way. it. And uh, we're not going anywhere. 
Exactly, like, I totally agree with that. Mars, but like, we're not going to the moon. Uh, like, moon, maybe. Since we are talking moon. about like the stack and like um, the power of uh, this technology, so we had like initially the TV. So it was like the idiot box because everybody was supposed to go nuts after watching the TV. But, but it they was were all watching the same thing, which made it actually, in a way, exactly. But it was like a very a passive form of uh, media consumption compared to the uh, current media technologies we have today, which can like, which uh, using which you can like individually, like influence people and stuff. So uh, this yeah. influence is the keyword I'm focusing on. Since and, like it's, and it's the individuation that I'm focusing on. Exactly. That, that's, that, that's the sort of So who I controls am. it and should it <laughs> really be controlled? <laughs> and like, what are the ethical issues revolving around it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. But the first thing is, is, is it doesn't matter who controls it if its whole thing is predicated on this hyper-individuation and this predictive models of this. As long as this is the system the way it's set up, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It's good. You're going to have very similar kinds of technological outcomes. It, it really doesn't, it does not matter what hat the person in the building is wearing if the rest of the dominoes are structured that way. Anybody else? All right, so should we meet tomorrow? Ready to go? OK. Um, so we tomorrow we will, um, oh, we're late for our call. This is this as well. Um, so tomorrow we're going to go through, we'll go through the next two. Um, we're going to go through sort of bit by bit through on this as well, the automation and ecology and the regime um, regime chapter, regime chapters. If you, if you read them good, but it's fine. But as you can see, we kind of, we're going to be kind of unpacking these. And, bit more detail than, we, than we've had before. But great conversation for the first couple of days. Um, chew on it, give, give it some thought uh, around the sort of thing to go. Um, in terms of the conversation tomorrow, just things that you'd like to sort of revisit from the conversation today, by all means, let's sort of bring it back. It's always, it's always about you know, iteration and recapitulation, and recapitulation and iteration, and figuring out well, how one thing connects to another. Um, so by all means, we can we will consider to sort of to do, to do that as well. Okay, so thanks everyone, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.